Bush and Graham Owen with the planning division. Before I get started, we ask that all attendees be sure that the microphones are muted on your devices, and please also be aware that tonight's meeting will be recorded for future viewing from the SSPA website. Before I go on, I'd also like to like to recognize that uh, Providence D District Supervisor Dahlia Palchik is here with us, and uh, Supervisor Palchik, if, if you'd like to uh, take the floor now, uh, you can to, for some uh, for an opening welcome and any opening uh, comments you'd like to make. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, and good evening to everyone joining us tonight. Thank you to our DPD staff um, and to all the staff joining for this. And I know many, many evening meetings that you are taking away from your families to help us um, share this information with our community. So as many of you know, this is um, the first meeting we're holding on this in the Providence District. I believe we have six applications tonight. Um, we have the one known as the AT&T site in Oakton, um, a couple near the Vienna Transit area, and then three in the Merrifield or Dunloring metro area. Um, so this is the first time in the Providence District since I've been supervisor that we're part of the site specific plan amendment process. As you all probably know, this year we are doing all of the, the entire county together. Um, and this tonight, um, just an early um, opportunity and really appreciate those of you who are joining us tonight, an early opportunity, especially for the neighbors or those who work um, in these areas to hear the presentations, to give initial feedback. Um, nothing is solidified at this point. These are um, applications that made it through an initial screening just to know that they were eligible. Um, and now we'll be going through the community outreach um, process as well as further screening um, from staff and our offices to understand which ones um, will be able to move forward um, and when in our work plan and the staff's work plan that they, that will be happening. So you will be hearing quite a bit more from staff tonight. I think many of the applicants have also been able to join tonight to share, to answer questions or to ask their own questions. Um, this is a different process than has happened in the past. Uh, and I hope and trust that it's one that really will um, help us be effective and efficient, both in the outreach and the input, as well in helping ensure that we have the best possible outcomes for our community. Um, so again, just want to thank all of you for joining. If you have friends or neighbors who were not able to join tonight, this is being recorded, and I hope you will share it with them. And you can always reach out to me in my office at providence at fairfaxcounty.gov. So to that, I will send it back to Stephen and his team. Uh, and thank you all for your presentations and your participation tonight. Have a safe uh, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Palchik. So tonight we'll begin with a brief overview of the comprehensive plan and an explanation of how the SSPA process fits within the way Fairfax County plans for future development and, and growth. From there, we'll focus on each of the six Providence sites and nominations that were submitted, each of the, each of the, the Providence District SSPA nominations that were submitted on sites near the I-66 corridor. I'll take a first minutes. I'll take a first. Uh, first, I'll take a few minutes to go over the SSPA process. Um, countywide SSPA pro, uh, SSPA cycles provide an opportunity for anyone to survive, to submit a proposal for changing the county's comprehensive plan land use recommendations for an individual property or on a site containing a group of properties within the same small area. As you can see on this slide, we are in the screening for, screening phase for SSPA nominations, and this is the very beginning of a planning and review process for several proposed projects that have been nominated. Before any of these nominations can be authorized to move through screening, we first need to get get feedback from the community on the, on the nominated projects, so the planning commission can provide recommendations to the Board of Supervisors for which these nominations for which of these nominations should be added to the plan amendment work program for further study. The county is currently screening <coughs> 70 different nominations for sites that were submitted by county county citizens, private landowners and members of the development community for consideration during the countywide SSPA cycle. 
And this is where your feedback can help the planning commission and board of supervisors determine which nominations might warrant dedication of the county's time and resources for further study on the comprehensive plan plan amendment work program. <clears throat> as, super, as, as Supervisor Palchik said, the screening phase is when we work together to identify key considerations that should be applied to reviewing these proposals if they are to move beyond screening. Perhaps the most important question that we should ask are, how well does this nomination align with support, align with support and promote existing goals and objectives of the county's adopted land use policies and strategic planning initiatives? Next, how do you feel these nominations might align with your ideas for how the community should be planned for possible growth in the future? <clears throat> so what is the comprehensive plan? Although the Code of, of Virginia requires each lo locality in the state to maintain a comprehensive plan, policies provided in the plan are not the same as regulatory codes or law. Instead, the comprehensive plan provides guidance for our elected officials and appointed officials in Fairfax County to make decisions related to the natural and built environment. County agencies, members of the public and the development community also use the plan as a guide to help us think about the potential impacts and possible benefits when, when various kinds of land use changes are being considered in the planning process. So this map shows the concept for future development in Fairfax County. The concept for future development is another tool that we can use to understand how the county plans for future growth. This map provides a general framework for identifying the areas for where the various types of development exist in our, and are encouraged to take place throughout the county. <clears throat> the legend and color coding show us that suburban neighborhoods and low density residential areas are the most predominant land, land development patterns that cover the largest area of land in Fairfax County. Understanding this, the comprehensive plan recommends for most of the county's new residential and commercial and commercial growth to take place in areas designated for mixed use development, like the Flint Hill and Maryfield subdivision uh, suburban centers, and also around transit station areas such as Dunloring and Vienna. In planning, these, these areas are often referred to as development centers and special planning areas because each one has its own distinct set of opportunities, challenges, and needs. So the written text of the area plan assigns a unique set of recommendations to help us guide how future development takes shape in each of the areas that we see outlined. In late February through March, next in, the, in late fe February, through March after the screening has taken place it, it, in this phase, the Planning Commission will host sc screening workshops to further discuss the nominations and also make recommendations to the Board of Supervisors on which of the nominations should move past the screening phase. Members of the, of the public are also invited to partic participate in these Planning Commission workshops. And you can see the dates of the workshops on the right. After the workshops have been completed, the Board of Supervisors will, will review Planning Commission recommendations along with community input and then decide which nominations are to be added to the Plan Amendment workshop to ensure to the I'm sorry to the Plan Amendment work program to ensure the best use of available time and staff resources. The board may choose to assign the highest priority to proposals that are found to be most closely aligned with the county's adopted goals, land use adopted policies, land use goals, and other related county initiatives. Nominations that do not, not pass through screening will be removed from consideration of being placed on the work program. However, those sites are not, however, those sites that are not considered for plan amendments can still be developed under the existing comprehensive plan recommendations, current zoning regulations, and also any development entitlements that are already in place for those sites. Since the SSPA nominations are proposed a development of a type, form, and size or scale that would require the county to consider changing the adopted comprehensive plan, next we'll review a few of the planning terms that will be heard throughout tonight's discussion. Density and intensity are, are the two most common terms that we'll use 
when we talk about land use planning to the, to convey the quant the quantity and the scale of development proposed. Residential density is a calculation of the number of dwelling units that can be developed for each acre in a site. Single family detached dwelling units like you see in the top left hand corner are often developed between one to five dwelling units per acre and considered to be low density residential development. Suburban townhouse development, like you see to the right of that, is often developed, developed anywhere between five to 12 dwelling units per acre and also considered to be somewhere near the middle of the county's density ranges. Multifamily housing such as apartments and condominiums are built at higher densities that can take on various forms such as garden style apartments with 16 to 20 dwelling units per acre or mid rise residential development with as many as 30 to 40 or more dwelling units per acre and as high rise urban residential development of 60 to 60 to 80 dwelling units per acre or more. Floor area ratio or FAR is a term most used to describe the intensity of non-residential and mixed use development, which often combines both residential uses and non-residential uses. To calculate FAR, you divide the floor area of building space by the land area in a development site. So in the examples we show, we show here on the right, you can see three different design scenarios that would all yield an intensity of 1.0 FAR on a 100,000 square foot parcel. One exhibit shows a four story building with 25,000 square feet on each floor and it only covering one quarter of the site with the rest of the site shown as open space. And then another scenario shows a two story building with 50,000 square feet on each floor. And then the final building, of course, shows a 1000 square foot building covering the whole the whole site that's available for development. So back to screening, all feedback is encouraged during the screening process. And tonight, we are, we are again asking everyone to keep their devices muted until you're called on. Please use the raise the hand icon at the top right of your screen to let us know when you have questions or comments to share. We're here to answer questions and we really value having this opportunity to learn more from members of the communities that are near these nomination sites. The locations of the six nominations that we will be discussing tonight are circled on the map with the names of the with their names highlighted highlighted and also listed in order. So the first site is in the Flint Hill Community Planning Sector of Oakton. And then next we'll look at two nominations that are in and adjacent to the Vienna Transit Station area. And finally we'll move farther east to focus on three nomination sites in the Maryfield Suburban Center. As we go through each of the nominations, I will provide the planning background with preliminary considerations identified in staff's initial review and then allow a representative, a, rep a representative for each of the nominations to briefly discuss their proposals. Afterwards, we'll open, this, open the discussion up to hear from the community and try to answer your questions as best as possible. So the first site we'll look at is nomination PR004 at the AT&T campus. This map shows where the subject site is located within the, the outline for the Flint Hill Suburban Center. The comprehensive plan identifies suburban centers as employment centers that are located along major arterial roads and also recognizes that they are, are evolving to include mixed use cores that are more urban in character. Flint Hill is the county's smallest suburban center and is currently one of the two suburban centers that do not have a, have core areas identified and planned out by the adopted plan. The 32 acre subject parcel is, is the largest parcel in the suburban center. The adopted plan currently recommends for the site to be developed in an intensity of up to 0 0.40 FAR and in a manner that is compatible with the existing development of the site. Which you can see here is a large four story office building 
with a surface parking lot that covers nearly half of the site. And then the site also has vegetated open space buffers along its perimeters. So for staff's considerations of this uh, of this proposal, we're, uh, we're looking at the current utilization of the existing building and its parking facilities and the potential to establish a mixed a mixed use suburban core and compatibility with adjoining residential neighborhoods. Additional considerations are for the proposal to the nominations proposal to include a, an internal grid of streets and potential new new connections and alternative and alternatives to the existing adjacent roads. So with us tonight is is Evan Goldman, who will speak to the uh, nominators case for the uh, for this nomination and. Thank you, Stephen. Can everybody hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes, yeah, okay, we can perfect. hear you fine. Mm -hmm. OK, great. I can uh, share my screen. Just give me one second. OK, uh, let me see. There we go. OK, perfect. I can see all of you, too. Um, are, are you folks seeing my screen? Great. Um, so my name is Evan Goldman. I'm an executive vice president acquisitions and development from EYA. Um, I'm one of the owners of the company and we have been working with the owner of this site for the last few months on a potential design. Um, and as part of that, um, reached out through this SSPA amendment process. Um, so we'll walk you through some ideas very, very early at this point. Um, and just so folks are aware, we have been starting to have meetings with the community as well. So we've met with five or six of the closest HOAs. And if there's anyone on this call who lives in the area who hasn't been um, contacted yet, please feel free to reach out to us because uh, we'd love to meet with as many people as possible. Um, just a little background. So EYA, we're a local company. We've been around for 30 years um, and we do we call it missing middle or kind of uh, middle housing between kind of high rise um, apartment buildings and smaller single family homes. So we do a lot of townhomes. We do a lot of uh, low low rise apartment buildings. Uh, we do retail. We do place making. We do master planning. Um, and those all um, fit nicely within what we're talking about here in this sector where the site itself is surrounded by townhomes and apartments. Um, these are examples of some of our projects and some of the architecture. And so on the bottom right is Robinson Landing um, on the waterfront in Old Town Alexandria, a beautiful scaled building that really fit within the neighborhood, had a bunch of wonderful amenities and park spaces and open spaces. Um, and then some of the architecture of some of our townhome projects are pictured here as well. Uh, we've been around for 30 years, as I said, we've built more than 50 neighborhoods, largely um, inside the Beltway or just outside the Beltway and a ton of stuff in Fairfax County. Um, the site that we're talking about here today, Stephen gave a, a great overview. Um, as we've talked to neighbors, um, the first comments we've heard were, I'm oh, sorry, this is a little bit of background, then I'll get to that. Um, the background, uh, AT&T had actually used to own the property. They built the building for themselves initially. It's 400 and uh, some odd thousand square feet, 440,000 square feet. And at this point, it is about 10% occupied, largely due to COVID. So um, AT&T has gone to a, a work schedule where they allow people to work from home. The building is is obsolete. It was built literally for the single user. And um, so there's really no way to reuse it for any other use. And so the optimum use is to actually tear it down and build something new. Uh, there were 1800 employees here in its heyday. Um, and as I said, they're down to about they're down to under 200. Um, the new owner of the land is working with AT&T, so they have an option. They can either build a new building on the site um, in a more modern format and stay. They have the option to leave, so they'll figure that out. But any plan we do would give that flexibility. And um, and the thought now is how do we re think this site so we maintain some of the beauty of the beauty, I should say some, the beauty and the transition to the neighborhood. So our vision is transforming this underutilized commercial property into an appropriately scaled mixed use neighborhood, uh, respecting the existing residential context that surrounds it and creating a new highly amenitized gathering place for the community. Uh, this is the feedback we've heard to date um, and that we uh, many of these things were things we thought of as well. Um, so an appropriate density to the suburban context uh, it should include a meaningful amount of open space um, as its top priority. 
uh, preserve the mature trees along the north, northern and western property lines, Chambridge and Germantown, respect the surrounding neighborhoods in terms of height and setbacks and stepbacks, and be responsive to the community's main concerns about traffic and school, which is something we'd obviously have to work through as the SSPA process progresses and we do more studies. And this is very consistent with everything we've been hearing so far. So as we started thinking about the site conceptually, um, you can see the idea is to preserve the open space along the edges, uh, especially along Chambridge Road, and turn that very beautiful treed space into open space for the community. An easement um, would be there, the park space, whether it's dog park or children's playground, outdoor restaurant seating, and make that a beautiful space for the community. Also preserve open space and buffers around the other sides of the site, where we're up against Board Street Park or the existing townhomes in the neighborhood. Create a, today, if you live near the site, you probably know a lot of people walk their dogs and hike around or, or urban hike around the site for exercise. So we'd want to formalize that into an actual um, hiking, biking kind of shared use path loop uh, so that people would have the opportunity to really use the site um, whenever they want to use it. Uh, we also would create a really nice park space in the center that'd be more of a town square uh, gathering place for movie nights and things of that sort. We then started looking at breaking it up, as Stephen said, into a grid of streets, trying to solve some of the traffic issues in the area, as well as some of the race track uh, that White Granite Drive creates. So, so many people race around this these bends and it's fairly dangerous for pedestrians. So by straightening that out and creating those connections through, uh, we can have four way stop signs that are much better for pedestrians and for people walking dogs and make it a safer place to walk around. And then also by creating a grid of streets, we give people other access points. So today, uh, Germantown Road backs up quite a bit at Chambridge on traffic, making left turns towards 66. And by having this development, it gives people other ways to filter through the grid of streets so that <clears throat> instead of all those cars making left at Germantown, a good portion of those cars can now make left at White Granite and they wouldn't be going through the residential community as they do today, they would be staying within our new development and it would be purposely designed for that. We then start filling in with building and product, product types. So uh, lower scale townhomes on the outside edge, especially up against the existing residential. Uh, we'd like to do a grocer um, in this corner here with a new traffic light off Germantown Road so that there's better access to the site. Um, residential and senior housing buildings surrounding the town square and then a uh, potential office building to the extent AT&T stays on the site, they'd be located right on the park. Um, we'd keep a right in right out off of Chambridge Road, um, not ask for a traffic light given the distance to Germantown Road, but we'd want that retail to be visible. Every, everywhere you see purple is retail, so that's our main street. And the idea is that the retail spills out into this um, open space along Chambridge. And then just some quick precedent images um, this upper left image is one of the images we have for that space on Chambridge. It's it's if you haven't been there and you have the chance to drive by on 120 on Chambridge Road, the trees there are are beautiful. They're tall and unlike most trees, the limbs are actually pretty high, so you can actually see under the trees all the way to the retail. And that gives us a special opportunity to actually program that space underneath the trees and create a place for people to to given how hot it gets here in the summer, actually be outside under trees day one when the park delivers. Uh, versus most new developments where you you know they deliver the project with old tree uh, with new little teeny trees um this is a, a space in north carolina where that's exactly what happens it's this beautiful um kind of meadow underneath the trees and people just sit out with movable furniture uh, we have more traditional um town square spaces like you know you might see in clarendon or rockville town square or bethesda other places um retail the, a lot of the retail would be restaurants so outdoor restaurant seating um, and urban you know, streetscape and wide sidewalks. And then the grocery store would be the only piece that would have a more suburban feel. Um, and that's in order to attract the grocer that we want in this market, uh, they need to have surface parking. Um, and that'd be the only surface parking we'd propose. The lawn spaces could be used for farmer's markets, for outdoor gathering, for Frisbee throwing, for events, uh, movie nights. So that's something we'd love to, all of our public spaces have public access easements and we'd like to work with the local community to make them their spaces. So that's the intention here. And then finally on architecture, um, these are from other projects that we've built all around the region. And I just shared this to give you a sense within our townhomes, the, the variety and style and scale EYA, we design all of our projects uniquely and individually. So our architecture um, is not repetitive, but from brownstones to crafts houses to more urban retail oriented townhomes, all of these have their own unique feel and we would do that here as well. And then finally, uh, multifamily as well. Um, place making on the buildings, whether it's through cool lighting or murals, um, setbacks and buildings, and a really beautiful, alive retail main street 
um, from a census scale, because I this has come up in some of our meetings, our last slide, but um, just for just for a census scale. So Mosaic has 550,000 square feet of retail. We're proposing about 80,000 here. So this is not Mosaic. This is not an enormous kind of retail destination with a huge target. And um, our goal is not to create and generate a ton of auto traffic to the site for retail. Um, our goal is to create neighborhood oriented retail. There will be obviously people that will drive to it from the you know few miles around it, but we'll also make sure people have the ability to bike and walk to it. Um, and it would become a really nice urban kind of town center for Oakton, which doesn't really exist today. Um, and so our four core pillars, um, enhancing connectivity with bikes, bike paths, shared use paths, pedestrian safety, and, and making sure vehicles will be able to get to and from the site, as well as through the, uh, the area um, around us. Seven acres of high quality open space and parks will be open to the public, um, improving environmental and stormwater standards in an area that has not had them for years. And then this kind of once in a generation opportunity to create a, a neighborhood scaled center in Oakton at what we would say is a one FAR. Um, so on the lower scale for town centers. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. So uh, with that, we will turn the floor over to uh, questions from the public. And uh, Evan, just for your reference, there are a couple of folks that uh, put some comments in the chat, um, oh. not questions, but just talking about uh, some HOAs that like to be reached out to. Awesome. Thank you. I'll look at that right now. Appreciate that. OK, I'll start at the top of the list. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Adam Vincius. Hi, good evening, everyone. Evan, can you put up the uh, the site diagram again, please? Sure. Uh, give me one second. Thank you. Um, uh, site diagram. There Perfect. you go. So there's an area on the bottom right um, along flagpole lane um, where there are existing townhomes right now. Can you tell me how much space is going to be between going to be between the existing townhomes and the proposed townhomes over on the left side? Yeah, um, I don't know if I have an exact dimension. We've actually met with that HOA. Um, so I don't know the demand, the space from their fronts of their houses to flagpole, um, but from flagpole to our closest house, that is approximately, uh, I know I'm going to say this and then end up being wrong. I think that's about 200 feet, uh, but we'll do, uh, we'll do sections through all of our, um, every part of our project where we touch an existing residential neighborhood, we'll do sections through it. So you can see an elevation, our buildings, the space in between, and then the buildings across the way and share those with the community as we get into design. But I think that's about 200 feet from flagpole. So my guess is you're probably 300 feet from the, maybe between 250 and 300 feet from the front of the house to the front of our, our houses. Okay, understood. Um, there's also a row of trees in that same general area. Is the plan to knock down those trees or leave them up? No, as long as the urban forest or believes that they're healthy trees that should remain, which we would try to. I, I didn't mention this because we didn't have much time, but EYA works really hard throughout the region to preserve trees. Um, that's one of our specialties. We were the first firm in the region of KC Trees support one of our projects, which was pretty cool. So yeah, we will try to preserve as many trees as possible. That's what makes sites so wonderful um, as for our new homeowners as well the as the existing. That said, to the extent there are trees that need to be removed, we obviously have to remove them. And then where I'd say there will be trees that would come down would be where the new streets come through for obvious reasons that the streets need to go through. You have to take down the trees that are there, uh, but we'll also plant a ton of new trees as well. Understood, Evan. And one of our other concerns is when Germantown gets backed up, we have a lot of folks who take white granite kind of yep. along the edge, like you mentioned before, and it tends yep. to get very backed up and folks kind of go through the stop signs. Yep. Um, I guess our concern is when we're building these kind of different four way stops around here, it's a safety and traffic issue because we do see folks kind of go zooming through the stop signs as is. Um, we're just wondering if there's a, a, a plan. I, I understand this is all overflow and instead of one white granite drive, you're you're kind of funneling all the traffic into four different streets. Right. Um, is there a, a plan to deal with that? Yeah, actually, the bigger issue is. So the, the bigger issue you have is that your streets are designed as suburban streets. They're very broad. Um, the buildings are set back very far. 
they have these enormous swooping curves and that all encourages speed. So when cars are coming through, there may be a stop sign, but their natural inclination from the design of the street is to go fast and to go through the stop sign. And, I, and I'll, I'm guilty of it myself. I've done it many times, not in this neighborhood. But. Um, so the benefit of building projects that are more urban in nature and have squared streets and grids is that it creates a dynamic, number one, where you have parked cars along the street, you have narrower drive lanes. We likely have bike lanes on many of these streets. You have um, sidewalks that are very pedestrian oriented. You'll have people walking around and you'll have stop signs at perfect four way corners that signal to people in urban areas to slow down and drive slower in the first place and then stop at the stop signs. And in those places, there's a lot more um, compliance with stop signs. So the thought is our goal would be to get as many cars as possible out, off of your streets, the flagpole lane piece that goes through your neighborhoods and design our streets so that they go through our neighborhood appropriately at the right, right speed and get out to white granite through our neighborhood and take that burden off of your community. Um, and that that is that's what we do all over the place. That's what we're doing here. Um, so that should solve some of the problem. It doesn't mean you're not going to have some folks speed through on flagpole still. Um, and Quite frankly, it could even be residents living in the townhomes off of flagpole. But we would for the traffic that's cutting through on Germantown ways is going to tell them to make a left turn into our development, make a right turn on granite and come through versus going on flagpole out of the way. Any thought to like speed humps or speed? Sometimes, bumps? yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And if it if it's a what's cool here is your area is a little bit of a cul-de-sac. So once we solve the cut through issue and get people off of flagpole, you shouldn't have that issue any longer, but we will work with you to the extent there's an issue and speed bumps make sense. Um, we've done those for neighborhoods around development as far as in the past. I mean, obviously, okay. VDOT and FCDOT would have to approve something like that. Understood. And and last question is, I, I know there was some kind of notional schedule earlier, but when would be the earliest that ground would actually break on this? Or is that kind probably, of a, a question for someone else? Thank you. Uh, it's probably about three years, so it typically takes typically takes about 12 to 18 months to go through the formal processes with the county and, and seek uh, approval. And it typically takes another year or so, sometimes a little longer to get through permits. So yeah, it's about two and a half to three years from now. Okay. And, and by the way, we will be our, we've just started community outreach. So if we haven't met with you or your community, 100% would love to, we will be meeting with communities all throughout the next six months before we submit anything. So there'll be plenty of time for people to give input. Okay. Thank you, Evan. You're welcome. Nice meeting you. Um, Evan, before we move on, I just wanted to uh, and this is going great and really appreciate everybody's <laughs> questions and comments. Um, I do want to just remind, remind folks that we do have five other nominations that we'll need to get through you know, as a part of this meeting. So um, if you have questions, terrific. Um, but at, at some point, we're going to need to move on to the other nominations. Um, so if we don't get to your question, um, there are plenty of other opportunities to uh, participate in SSBA, um, either by contacting staff directly uh, con contacting Evan directly, the other nominators. So just want to just want to let let people know that we'll, at some point we'll need to move on, you know, to the other nominations. Uh, but hopefully we can get through as many questions as we as we can. So I just wanted to state that uh, state that up front, so people will understand. Okay, good, to see. Okay, uh, next on the list that I'm seeing uh, is Barbara Hurd. Hi, this is Barbara. So I have a question about this four way stop signs that you're proposing. Has there mm -hmm. been given any thought to putting in roundabouts as opposed to four way stops? Um, we, yeah, so we haven't gotten even this is as far as we've gotten on planning so far. We haven't really studied traffic or traffic patterns at all yet. Um, I, we've done I think we've done two roundabouts in projects of ours. So in some places they make a lot of sense in places where you want a lot of pedestrian connectivity going across the street. Roundabouts are sometimes less safe. Um, they do slow auto traffic, which is good. So the auto, the cars will drive slower on the street between the roundabouts, which is really what their purpose is for. But when you want people directly crossing from a restaurant to another retail or you know walking their dog, you're better off with a four-way squared off intersection. It's safer. Roundabouts are often a better option um, versus very broad kind of two or three lane streets um, in each direction with traffic lights. The roundabouts start solving that, but they sometimes create pedestrian conflicts. Uh, but we're, we're open to looking at, at those types of things as well. OK, great. And then I had another question. Uh, I think it was the southeast corner. You had uh, you mentioned lower scale townhouses, townhomes. Mm -hmm. 
what is lower scale? Uh, so our townhomes are three stories from the front. And then they have a fourth story loft kind of bedroom with an outside rooftop deck. So the fourth floor is towards the alley. So from the, if you're looking at the front of the house, they would look like three stories. And from the back, they would look like four stories. All right. And then in the center where you have the, the center, central park, are you looking at using uh, actual grass for the park or are you looking at artificial turf? You're, it's funny. You're the third person that's asked me that question. So um, our intent would be to have natural grass. I, what I would say is that doesn't mean it would always remain natural grass if it becomes so popular that the natural grass gets destroyed. Um, so for full transparency, I worked for Federal Realty for eight years and built a project called Pike and Rose on Rockville Pike and, and I worked on a number of large mixed use projects. And we always have the intent of building grass. But when places are really popular and people use the lawn all the time, the lawn gets destroyed. So so the what we would do here is make sure that the spaces that are more passive or recreation oriented would 100% be grass, certainly the places up against the existing neighbors and the front along German, uh, Chambridge, that central park could have part of it as non, as turf, but there are really good turf products these days that are, first of all, they no longer have, there was some cancer causing issues, which has been resolved for the most part, and they're, they have permeable um, turf these days as well. So it, it, you know, it's a trade off. I'm not a huge fan of it, but sometimes it's the only option when a place it becomes really popular. Okay, thank you. And then the only yeah. other thing that I would say is set back, set back, set back, set back, because we don't want to see anything like what's being done in Vienna, where okay. we're creating a canyon down 123. And so that green space is incredibly important. This is a, awesome. a small community and uh, we like our parks. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Also, I put my email address in the contacts. I'm sorry, in the chat. So if anybody wants to reach out to me directly, feel free. And I'll try okay. to find the other communities that are in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next on the list, uh, I see L. D. Uh, Atavaro. Thank you. Um, I um, sit on the board of the Flint Hill Townhomes Community Association and Great. Flint Hill Manor Townhomes Association. We've been trying to reach you and haven't been successful yet. We're looking forward to meeting with you soon. Um, we're the In general, I would say the feedback I've gotten from most owners is very positive about this development. We're looking forward to having something more productive done with this space. And so many of our residents and, and owners have read your plan with great interest, and we're looking forward to giving you a greater detail in our comments. Um, I put a couple things in the chat box. One of them was about the 85 foot parking structures that are proposed in the plan. I think there are gonna be two of them and they would be kind of a distinguishing feature in this neighborhood. Um, I think somewhere in the narrative, it says they would be seven stories high. Um, there aren't any other seven story buildings in this area as far as I know, um, including in the other side of Route 123 heading to the west. So we're a little concerned that that's gonna be create a bit of an eyesore and, and possibly a shade issue and and sort of yep. overshadow um, the positive nature of the rest of the structures that are being built. So that's okay. one comment. I'll quickly speed through two more. One was just about um, lighting in the area. You may have known, noticed from walking through yourself that nighttime, you know, there's a great need for lighting in the area. And we really hope yep. that um, EYA will work with us to make sure that there's um, increased lighting um, be for because we're concerned about, you know, people some sort of wandering along and looking for crimes of opportunity because it's dark. Um, and another thing is about sidewalks along flagpole lane right yep. now there's a gra there's a sort of um, gravelly area along flagpole lane where any people can park their cars many yeah. of the residents in our association park there we want to make sure that that space is going to continue to be preserved and or paved and or include a sidewalk area and we'd love to hear more about what the plans will continue but we understand that if, if in the interest of time you may not have um, the ability to talk address all of those at this meeting this evening but we have a lot <laughs> to so talk about can you if you if you don't mind my email is e goldman at eya.com just email me directly tonight or tomorrow whenever you want and i will make sure we get a meeting set up we'd love to meet with your That's community fine. and all of your questions are great and things i think we can we can deal with excellent i will thank you very much you too So next on the list, I see Chris Kloss. Sorry if I pronounced that correct incorrectly. I'm sorry. No worries. Happens all the time. Uh, it's close. Uh, first of all, the project looks 
uh, beautiful. Um, it, it's really kind of stunning to see that vision take hold from what it is now. Uh, I think the only um, question I saw was actually the last bullet point on considerations with schooling mm -hmm. and um, uh, particularly the zoning in the area. One thing about region one schools that makes this such a great and highly desirable area is the schools here are exceptional, um, also limited uh, and uh, the structures are a bit old. And I guess my concern and my my ultimate question is, is Fairfax just recently released their uh, proposed capital budget for 2024 to 2028. And for currently proposed projects, they're looking at a shortfall of unfunded uh, monies of around $1.3 billion. So when you look at all the uh, residences that are going up and thinking about the impact that's going to have on the schools in the area, uh, how are you guys planning to square that circle with the county, considering the uh, the current challenges they're having there with uh, funding already proposed projects uh, up to 2028? So I, I think at this stage, I mean, we haven't done any analysis yet on schools. We're so early on. So I, I would pass that probably off to the county if you have a question, an answer for that. But we would get into that with all of you as this progresses. We, but we haven't done any analysis yet, uh, admittedly, on the schools. And that's the same in our case as well. Uh, these sites are so early. We know that schools, schools impacts are going to be a major um, consideration of most of these proposals that you see tonight because most of them do propose um, in, increased uh, residential density. But because we have not determined which of these uh, which of these projects that are being currently being screened should move on to the next phase as plan as plan amendments, we have also not engaged in that in that deep of an in, of an analysis at this point. But I think when we start looking at all 70 of the sites that are looked at throughout the county as a whole, those types of th those types of questions are going to help us prioritize and help the board and planning commission prioritize which sites may be ripe at this point for um, for looking at uh, replanning. And uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, it it does. I knew it was a big ask. I just uh, it's it's just nice to know the knowledge of the process and when it begins. I just know that's uh, that's a you know there's a lot of big rocks to kick around, and I feel like that was a pretty big one. So thank you so much for your response. No problem. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I see the name of Fran. Uh, this is uh, Fran. And I have uh, a question related to the, the units, the residential units. Can you give us a breakdown of what kind of units and a rough total of what you're talking about for the site? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, uh, on the townhomes, it's probably in the 250 to 300 townhome range or somewhere in that range. Um, and then there'd be three apartment buildings or two apartment buildings and a senior housing building. Uh, the senior housing would likely be 200 units or so, and then the two apartment buildings would probably each be about 300 units, um, and so 600. So in total, it's if you don't count senior housing, or even if you meet all three of those apartments, it's probably in the 1,200-ish unit range total, um, okay. which for a site of this scale um, is actually quite low, even though that sounds like a very large number just because of how big the site is. But the the nice thing about the size of the site it does create the opportunity to really create sense of place and parks and open space and retail, uh, but it does come with the units along with it. So, uh, Graham, I'm, I'm looking at the list and I think we have maybe about uh, five more hands raised that we hadn't gotten to yet. Uh, do you want to continue? Uh, answering questions at this point or yeah I think I think what we'll need to do is unfortunately I think we're going to need to maybe take like one or two more um I know that there are some additional hands that have that have been raised you know as we've been doing these but um just in the in the interest of time as well as just you know for respect for the other um the other folks that are on the call for other nomination thing we we should probably move on uh but I think I think we probably have one you know one or two quick quick questions and quick responses okay and and um I, Evan gave his uh, his email address and you also should have the county's email addresses too. So 
we are uh, we we still have time before these sites go to planning commission screening. So um, and, and I think Evan is still um, trying to do some more robust uh, community outreach. So yep. th this is your uh, last time to uh, interact with us. Yeah, and I'm feverishly writing everybody's comments and um, community names down so I can get in touch with you all. And, and any, anything that gets shared to me will be shared with to, to the county will be shared with Evans team and anything and vice versa. Anything I think that that they receive will be shared to us too. So so all the all the information through either channels will go to the planning commission. So next, uh, I, I think we'll we'll do one more question from Robert Means. Just one thing, I just want to say thank you. My call got dropped off, so I didn't get a chance to thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Good to good to see you virtually on the call. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Means. Yeah, thank you, um, and I appreciate your time. Um, overall, I I am uh, very impressed with the idea of making this a more walkable community. I hope that um, that kind of goal is is centered to this project and I think it would be a benefit. I do have some concerns about uh, both traffic safety, which people have talked about, so I won't go too far into that, but I did want to ask, are the blue arrows on flagpole and white granite, are those intended as four-way stops as well as the ones in, in the interior of the, of the new project? Great question. So, no, so the on starting, oh, let me share my screen actually, sorry, I really, I'm not sharing it. <coughs> So let's see. Hopefully you can see it now. Okay. Well, one thing. Okay. So the intent is to have a, a new traffic light here at the entrance to the project on Germantown. Uh, we're proposing that. Obviously, VDOT and FCDOT would need to support it. And that would allow for a safe pedestrian crossing from the communities to the north to the project. Um, and then also create a main entrance right at the grocery store. And also, I should mention this is planned as a surface parking lot, not a big tall garage for the residents across the street. This would be just a likely just a typical intersection, um, and um, and that wouldn't have stop signs. I can't on see what you're oh, you can't see my arrow. I can't okay. see what you're pointing at. Sorry. So starting from the left on Germantown Road, from Chambridge Road, the first intersection on Germantown is intended to be a traffic light with full crossing mm -hmm. with full crosswalks. The next intersection of Germantown Road would be a typical intersection, but would not have stop signs because I don't think we could get stop signs approved there on uh, by VDOT. And then as we go south, the intersection at Flagpole Lane and White Granite. Um, at White Granite in our new Main Street, we would certainly propose all-way stop, four-way stop sign. Within our development, we propose all-way stop signs. As we hit Flagpole, to the extent we can get VDOT to support a three-way stop sign, and if that's what the community wants, we would support that. Um, and similarly on the south side, to the extent the community wants a stop sign and crosswalks, that's great too. So we're not we're not dictating anything for those streets. It's really we'll work with the community, see what they want, where they want accessibility. Work with VDOT, FCDOT. We'll certainly have opinions on where um, stop signs should and shouldn't go. And um, it's a lot of it is around pedestrian safety, right? How do you get people to the neighborhood from the existing neighborhood surrounding it safely? Okay. The other question I had very quickly is just the whether it's realistic to expect to have a new uh, large retail facility. I know that in the, the most recent kind of vacancies for large retail uh, sites in the area, the what used to be a drugstore at the corner of 29, 29 and uh, 123, what's now the uh, Amazon um, Fresh store, those were, were vacant for really lengthy periods of time before their, their current um, tenants went in. Uh, there's also a, what used to be a, a Walgreens a little further uh, east of that. So I'm just wondering how realistic it is that you're going to that, that it, it's going to be possible to find um, uh, a retail presence there that that would be appropriate, um, given that that there hasn't been the much that much demand for that kind of site in the area recently. So so what's important with retail is is there's different types of retail, and I'm a, I'm a retail expert, so this is my world. We've hired a retail team already on this project. We've got a grocer that already is interested. Um, there is definitely demand for this level of retail. It's it's also not too much retail. So 80,000 square feet, of which 20,000 is a grocer, is approximately 15 to 20 stores plus a grocer. So it's not, as I said, this is not mosaic. This is not regional. This is not 100 shops we're trying to lease. 
So of those, let's say 20 stores, 10 let's will end up being restaurants, 10 will end up being local services, and then you'll have the grocery store. Um, what Oakton is lacking in, in the region, quite frankly, where you see a lot of vacancy is that we have a lot of obsolete retail, whether the spaces are not tall enough, uh, whether they don't have the right venting, whether they're in they're poorly parked, whether they are in suburban strip centers that haven't been renovated in years, maybe owned by people that don't live locally. Um, and in those spaces, there are some vacancies. But post COVID retail is has bounced back actually better than almost any other seg sector in the real estate industry. Um, and there is certainly demand for retail in this location. I'm, I mean, it has to be done right and the place making has to be wonderful, um, but especially people, restaurants demanding outdoor cafe space, um, there will there will certainly be demand for this location. All right. So so thank you, Evan. Thanks very um, much. As, thank you, Evan. As, yeah. as we uh, indicated before, please send uh, any of your questions and reach out to us. Uh, using using all the available channels with any additional questions or comments for the nominations. And uh, so uh, next we'll move to the Vienna Transit Station to the two no nominations that are planned in and around the Vienna, Vienna Transit Station area. The Transit Station area for Vienna is. I, I apologize. Am I going to get a chance to ask a quick question, please? I'm sorry. We, we have to move. We have to move on to the for time's sake. We have to I, move I on. I just have a very quick question. Um, is this intended to be a restrict restricted contract or an open contract for the agreements that are going to come to terms that that are going to be discussed here and all these with all these communities? So, Mr. Varun, we, we need to move on to the next nomination. I think Mr. Waller is about to start the presentation, but you can you can email us your specific questions uh, at dbdsspa at fairfaxcounty.gov. Thank you. OK, so. The Vienna Transit Station area is envisioned to be a mixed use center with transit oriented development consisting of a robust mix of residential office retail and service uses concentrated at its highest intensities within one quarter mile of the transit station platform. The subject site of nomination PR 005 is in land unit A of the Vienna Transit Station. In land unit A is recommended for mixed use development consisting of multifamily residential and office uses up to 0 0.50 FAR. Additional residential uses allowed on undeveloped portions of the of land unit A are planned at an average of 20 to 30 dwelling units per acre. And the adopted plan also allows each each plan square foot of office space to be converted to one square foot of residential uses. The portion of the site shaded in green here is recommended to remain as private open space and it serves as a naturally preserved buffer for the Hunters Branch stream. The nomination proposes two scenarios for residential uses and or senior living facilities up to a density up to a maximum density of 65 to 80 dwelling units per acre, which could potentially include adaptive re reuse of the existing office buildings and also one of the parking structures or for partial uh, for partial development or complete redevelopment of the entire site with multifamily residential uses. Uh, so th there were two two uh, different concepts for redevelopment provided uh by the with the nomination and the nominator is here to further explain th their proposal but first i'll go through a few of the preliminary co uh, co considerations that staff has identified so if nomination pr 005 is added to the work program for further study then staff's preliminary considerations note that scenario two proposes development at the high end that would be nearly three to four times greater than the current plan guidance for converting office to residential uses and or adaptive reuse of the existing buildings. These proposed densities are also higher than what is planned for sites that are closer to the metro station and this would be counter to the adopted plan guidance for the transit for transit oriented development in the T TSA. Therefore any resident any Redevelopment that is studied should also set goals for reducing the number of automobile trips below what is currently planned for office uses at the full capacity. 
through ver various improvements that could promote safe and convenient access for the residents to nearby transit, transit facilities. Lastly, the site should also be designed to ensure that high quality and usable open space is available to adequately serve prospective residents without compounding any area wide needs that may currently exist. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to the representative for this nomination, Jill Parks. And I'll Thanks, stop Steve. sharing, stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Steve. I am Jill Parks. I am here with my colleague Sam Steckety, who's going to be running the presentation for us. We are with Hunt and Andrews Kurth um, as the designated agent and land use attorneys for the lender of the property, which is in the process of taking title. Slide two, Sam. The 13.9 acre nominated property is located at 9300 and 9302 Lee Highway in Fairfax, immediately north of Lee Highway, mostly south of Hermosa Drive and west of Nutley. Although when Nutley was constructed, it bifurcated the property, leaving two small residual parcels to its east. Here's an aerial that shows the proximity of the nominated property, which is outlined in red, together with the two residual parcels, to many of your neighborhoods. Slide. The nominated property is within the larger 56.9 acre Hunters Branch development established more than 40 years ago, which includes four land bays A to D. The nominated property is within land bay A in the southeast quadrant of the larger project shown in purple on the slide. Land bays B, C, and D are all developed with stable residential communities. Land bay B is home to Regents Park at Metro Center, which is comprised of 352 garden apartments. Land bay C includes Regents Park 2 at Metro Center, which is seven multifamily apartment buildings and 54 townhomes. And land bay D includes the Dwell Vienna Metro Apartments, 259 apartments. Across all four land bays, there are 1.201 million square feet of residential uses, or 961 dwelling units, and 1.2 million square feet. Um, I'm sorry, and about 400,000 square feet of non-residential uses. Next slide. I want to point out that the nominated property is about a half a mile south of the Vienna Fairfax GMU Metro Rail Station and entirely within the area designated by the county as the Vienna Transit Station area. While the Transit Station area, or TSA, is planned for transit-oriented development and one of the county's stated objective for its future development is to capitalize on the opportunity to provide for transit focused housing. The Vienna TSA is not one of the primary economic drivers of the county, so new residential buildings here can be attractive and highly amenitized, but still more affordable than the unattainable new buildings in say Ruston or Tyson's. Next slide. As Stephen said, the nominated property is currently improved with two 200,000 square foot, 12 story office buildings constructed in 1987 and 1989 and known as Hunters Branch 1 and Hunters Branch 2, together with limited surface parking and two structured parking decks, one four story with 706 parking spaces and a five story garage, including 1,462 parking spaces. Next slide. You've heard that the SSPA or site specific plan amendment process is essentially a visioning exercise. It's meant to be used when the county's comprehensive plan text is not consistent with the community's vision for the long term development of a property. But there are no bulldozers coming down the street just because a nomination has been filed here. That's especially true. As compared with the majority of nominations that are under review, we are not concurrently processing a rezoning application with the nomination. We haven't even begun to prepare one yet. Rather, we're starting from the beginning now, because although the majority of Hunter's Branch has been built out, the nominated property is underutilized and the existing office buildings are soon to be vacant. As such, we are just beginning to explore ways to bring the property current and more in keeping with its surrounds, which we acknowledge includes your founding residential communities, so we welcome all of your ideas. Of course, these assets are too important to the county's economic development to sit vacant for an indeterminate amount of time. So at the end of the SSPA process, we do intend to prepare and prosecute a zoning application to implement the best option for the long-term development of the property, one that maximizes its enviable and metro approximate location and guarantees its compatibility with the rest of the Hunter's Branch neighborhood. 
Next. As Steven suggested, and to keep our options as broad as they possibly can be just for the plan amendment, we've come up with two main redevelopment options. The first is an adaptive reuse of the existing office buildings plus new construction. And that includes the, the adaptive reuse of both of the office buildings as either senior living facilities, which may include a continuing care facility, independent living facilities, assisted living facilities, memory care units, or skilled nursing, or as multifamily dwelling units. And in that scenario, we would also want to redevelop the second garage as a multifamily residential building. Next slide. Alternatively, the second option contemplates the demolition of both Hunter's Branch buildings and the second garage and new construction of a more expansive multifamily residential building or buildings. In both scenarios, the nominator is recommending that the owner retain garage one to serve, that's the five story garage that you can see on the slide there, to serve the future development and to demolish garage two behind it. The nomination includes a range of units, 913 to 1124, 65 to 80 dwelling units per acre, and an FAR of 1.5 to 184 that could be developed on the nominated property. With the final development program, depending in large part on the parking ratios that are ultimately established for the project pursuant to the zoning ordinance or an approved parking reduction. The projects in both scenarios will respect the established floodplain limits and the forested areas along the eastern portion of the property. They will be preserved and protected. Next slide. In the post pandemic world, employees have grown accustomed to working from home. And as a result, many office tenants are continuing to downsize. And as lease terms near expiration, employers' flights to quality, meaning moves to more urban designer workspaces with high-end amenities and perks, continues. Particularly in light of these and other social trends, the development plan that was conceived for the nominated property more than four decades ago, and the 1980s styled Hunter's Branch 1 and 2 buildings and multiple above-grade parking structures that were constructed as a result no longer reflect the best use of the nominated property. With the kickoff of the county's SSPA process, it's the right time to reimagine its potential. With the county's growing need for an increased and varied supply of housing, particularly at Metro, our proposal to adaptively reuse and or replace the obsolete office buildings, either with senior housing or multifamily residential units, a meaningful portion of which would be developed as affordable housing units, aligns with the county's economic development strategies, addresses its needs to have on offer a continuum of housing options that are available to a range of incomes and residents, and promotes its inclusivity and shared prosperity goals as a result. We appreciate staff's initial feedback, thank you, Stephen, and anticipate your potential concerns about the compatibility of any future development on the nominated property with your established neighborhoods. So we are committed to working in collaboration and in partnership with you as the nomination hopefully advances through the board's work program to fully vet the ultimate concept and develop appropriate comprehensive plan text to guide it. I wanna say one other thing. I know that the nomination before me reached out and spoke with a number of your homeowners and civic associations, and we're happy to do the same. We are just not in the same place of design and development as they are. And so it's just, it wasn't the appropriate time, but we are obviously more than willing and able to sit down and meet with all of you individually or collectively, um, however you see fit. If you wanna contact me, my email address is jparks at huntinak.com. And Sam, will put that in the chat for you. Thanks. Thank you, Jill. I am looking at our uh, looking at our, our, at our list of guests and trying to see if any hands are raised for this proposal. If not, I, we are also seeing that some comments have been made. So some written comments have been made. And um, I think everyone can see those written comments. Uh, OK, uh, looks like we have at the top of my list, we have uh, Philip. I think it says. I'm sorry, uh, La Hi, Latassa. Philip Latassa, OK. Yes. Hi, uh, Philip Latassa with uh, Friends of Accutane Creek. Uh, I want to compliment you for not uh, proposing as some other 
developers have proposed to develop in the resource protection area alongside the uh, stream here, which is also called Hunter's Branch. And uh, <clears throat> however, that uh, wooded area along the stream is uh, badly invaded by uh, a lot of uh, exotic inv invasive species. And I would uh, encourage you to consider uh, in your proposal a, a plan for uh, improving the health of the woods and the waters in that area by controlling those species and, and perhaps other means recommended by the county. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Steve, you're muted. Next, we have Linda with questions. Hi, Graham, and hi, Jill. Hi, Linda. Uh, Jill, you and I had the discussion about your parcels over on the other side of Nutley, showing them as some sort of possible amenity, when in fact, the parcel that you have there for the amenity is a gully with a Dominion Power Station in it. I would suggest that you reconsider that as there's too much topography. If you wipe out the trees, you'll erase the buffer to the existing neighborhood and the camouflage for that Dominion Power Station. I'd also like to second the comment uh, that you just had about the invasive there along the stream. They are becoming overwhelming, I suspect. The trail there through the stream valley also needs work. There has been a lot of neglect and probably a lot of mischief down there as well. One of the other concerns that we will have is sort of cumulative. You're talking about a conversion of commercial to residential. And of course, that means all of the necessities that a new residential neighborhood will have in terms of public facilities, schools, parks, all of those things. And not only do we have it on this corner, but we have it across the road over at Pan Am. So we will be looking at both of those together and cumulative impact is something that really has to be considered with all of these things right here, particularly with public facilities, transportation, this is a lousy intersection. So again, we will be talking to you about all of these things and hoping that we will have an opportunity to do that in the future. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, one thing I will say is, you know, we haven't really convened our team yet, but as this project advances, one of the first things that we're of course gonna do is retain, you know, our civil engineers and environmental consultants to look at all of the questions and issues that you've just raised. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, uh, Mrs. Smith, and also uh, thank you, Jill. Um, there was one other hand raised, but I, I think that hand has been lowered now. So uh, as with the previous proje project, please email us, and uh, the nominator has also been asked to, to continue out reaching with the community. So uh, there, there's one name. I, I see Dwayne Jefferson. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, you can uh, you can unmute yourself and provide any comments or questions. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, I, uh, I just want to ask a question, and I guess it's more of a process question uh, for the county officials as well as you, uh, Jill. Is it that, uh, well, first off, let me say, what I heard from your comments was basically, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, what, you, what I heard you say was that there aren't any um, uses contemplated under the current uh, zoning for that parcel. Is that correct? Right, so right. as, so as I'm, 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 oh, there's a, put an echo, could you mute yourself for just one second? Yes. I Thanks, Dwayne. Um, under the current comprehensive plan, about approximately 400,000 square feet of non-residential uses are permitted for this land bay. And under the governing entitlements, which was you know, initially a rezoning followed by a long series of conceptual and final development plan amendments and proper amendments, um, at the very end of which this property is still approved for approximately 400,000 square feet of non-residential uses. 
Okay, so then is it that uh, zoning amendment here is inevitable in your view? I mean, is that is that how this plays out, that something will be done to, to, to change the, the zoning of that parcel? Absolutely. Um, I'm sorry, can you mute again? Thank you so much. Absolutely, and as I, um, I think I said in the presentation, it's our intent that at the end of all of this, we'll start a rezoning um, application that will implement the comprehensive plan guidance that we ultimately developed. But what I wanted to highlight is what we're not doing is taking a preconceived notion or concept or idea and trying to shoehorn it into comprehensive plan language that we can then just go run with. We're actually starting at the beginning. We're looking at the site. We're coming up with the sort of highest and best use of the property. We want to develop plan text that reflects that. And then we'll prepare the zoning application that implements it. Kind of every, we don't want to put the cart before the horse one step at a time. Okay. And then the, the last aspect of the question has to do with sort of a, a comprehensive look at what's being proposed. Because as I look at, you know, the flyer that came out, you've got, uh, you know, at least, you know, with respect to Evan, who spoke earlier, he mentioned some senior uh, uh, assisted living facility, not with all the, the contours you did, but um, he also addressed that use. You're addressing it in your proposal. Uh, Linda mentioned the fact that there's going to be something going on at Pan Am that has to do with, you know, uh, multifamily units as well as yours. And then you look at this list that we have here, you've got uh, Alliance Center condos with a with a plan, Prosperity Business Campus, the Merrifield situation. All of these are uh, would have you know uh, high density it seems uses. And the, just the question is, what is you know? And this may be for the county officials. You know, is this a zero sum game? I mean, is there some objective in the context of okay, we can we can you know we can approve this and it's to the exclusion of of, of that. I mean, how how does that work? I mean, can all these things go vote? I think what we'll do is uh, what the county is doing now is we're taking we're having community meetings for like this for each of the nominations and we're taking taking the community's uh, comments and questions. But at the end of the process, when it goes to the planning commission, that's when a, a large part of that discussion is going to be had. Uh, part of the discussion is going to be what's going on in this neighborhood that's already providing the, the types of uses or or what's going on in, in certain areas that are already fulfilling uh, the needs for you know certain uses compared to what is uh, what is being nom what what the nominations are proposing some of the some of the com some of the uh, considerations that the planning commission are going to take is are these you know are, are these being planned in areas and on sites that are where the county has already has already planned for growth and it, if they are is is the plan is the proposed growth gonna take the, the county's plans and, and, the, and the county's ideas for how much for the capacity of that growth to a level that requires and uh, you know that that warrants an in-depth study of these things if if, if the answer to some of these questions are, are, are you know, if, if the Planning Commission feels that the answer to some of those questions are no, this site in this area is not ready for a certain level of development at this point in time for any of these nominations, then the Planning Commission is is with, with, without a solid plan to to address the issues that, that that type of development might cause. The Planning Commission is is likely to say no, this, you know, the this nomination is is maybe right for the future, but now is not the right time, or maybe never is the right time for for any any of the given nominations. So so that's that's the level of detail that the planning commission is going to look at look into it. And questions like questions like this are 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 good to put to to escalate because it, it, even though I know it's going to be in the, in the minds of the planning commissioners, it, it it's good for the planning commissioners to also know that it's in the minds of the community members as well. Thank you, if, I can, if I can add to that, Stephen, um, I would like to say I, I think at a high level in concept, sort of senior housing generally, they're they're not mutually exclusive. I, I think it's you know it's not one of the things that you know if it goes here, it can't go there. I think you got to look at the particular site and the constraints of that site and the adjacent uses and the compatibility, and then determine 
whether that site sort of on its own merits is appropriate for that kind of use. And especially with senior housing, I think everyone would agree that you know, we we can't get enough of it. Um, there There isn't a lot of it right now in Fairfax County and, and we can't get enough of it. And we really need sort of really good products. Um, and so I think that's a really good use that a lot of people are sort of considering now, especially as the population ages and we're looking for places to accommodate them, you know, happily. Um, and also I just want to say, so in the comprehensive plan, process just because it gets incorporated into the plan text itself doesn't mean that that's what must be developed or will necessarily be developed the language that we're looking for is more permissive it's meant to be a recommendation for the use of the property which is why for our site for example we're proposing you know multifamily residential or senior housing because right now at this stage in the process we're not really sure you know what will work best we haven't yet you know taken a tour of the neighborhoods assessed the market competition done all of those things so we're just trying to give ourselves options so that when we do really drill down on a concept we can make the best decision possible without having to go back through thanks jill and one one last comment and i'll echo uh, two things in it um you know uh first is there was a gentleman who spoke about the schools earlier. Um, I, I want to underscore that and, and bold that because, you know, I hear that often from residents in the HOA um, that I'm in. And basically, uh, to me, from the 20,000 foot level, the least impact on those populations is going to be, you know, trending towards your senior uh, community. Um, but, you know, once you start picking between, you know, where the, the, the high density is and what districts uh, and where those downstream impacts are going to be, um, you know, if, if, depending on the timing of, of when these developments come on board, uh, those can be some acute impacts that uh, should be avoided, um, in my view. Uh, so, you know, it seems if you're even going to get into the arena of talking about high density, you know, you're, you're looking, you got to look, you got to solve the school problem first. I just don't, I don't see how you can kind of introduce a whole bunch of units in multiple locations feeding to the same system that's already overwhelmed. Absolutely agree. And the, the county does have a formula um, where they sort of calculate how many students are generated by every project based on the number of units that are proposed. And so the county is going to work with us hand in hand and they will make sure that we do our we do our duty by the children and by the schools. And we will. And, and again, that, that level of detailed review would uh, would normally come come okay. into play if the if the planning commission determined and, and board determined that a, a any given nomination deserves further study as a plan amendment. So, all right. So, thank you, Jill. We'll move on to the next nomination. Um, the next nomination uh, is just to the northeast of the site that we just reviewed, the site that we just reviewed across Nutley Street. I, I think someone is maybe unmuted. So if everyone could please mute. I was getting a little feedback. Thank you. So uh, as you can see on the map, SSPA nomination PR001 Briarwood Farms is just outside of the Vienna Transit Station area. And it's planned in the Lee Community Planning Sector. A suburban neighborhood. The concept for future development identifies suburban neighborhoods as stable areas that are pre predominantly predominantly residential and contain a broad mix of allowable densities and styles supported by parks and open space. The adopted plan generally recommends for very little or no changes to occur within these sub suburban neighborhoods. The subject site contains seven parcels that are currently planned and developed for residential uses at a density of one to two dwelling units per acre. The nomination is requesting consideration of a plan amendment to allow redevelopment up to a density of four to five dwelling units per acre. The nominator's statement of justification mentions the adjacent Briarwood Trace subdivision, which was redeveloped under a plan option for four to five dwelling units per acre. Staff's preliminary, preliminary considerations are listed to the right of a conceptual, uh, the, conce the conceptual sketch that was submitted with the nomination to show the potential layout of 17 new lots on the subject site and at the proposed density of four to five dwelling units per acre. 
if nomination if nomination PR001 were to be added to the plan amendment work program, then staff's preliminary considerations note that an increase in density directly across from the Vienna transit station area may also increase the needs for improved bike and pedestrian facilities supporting connectivity with the transit station and other nearby amenities and services. Additionally, any changes planned on the site should also demonstrate that a proper site layout can be achieved in a way that does not impact the adequacy and availability of nearby amenities and facilities that are currently planned to serve the community uh, to serve the community. And those facilities could include parks and open space or uh, stormwater facilities or anything of that nature. And uh, so uh, the nominator, Mr. Clark, is here with us tonight to represent his uh, nomination and, and the proposal that uh, that is uh, in the nomination. And I will turn the floor over to over to you, Mr. Clark, to uh, give a little brief overview of uh, your idea and your, your plans for this nomination. Uh, the first thing I'd like to point out in the beginning, uh, unlike the previous two uh, speakers on behalf of the previous two nominations, um, I'm not a developer. I'm not a, a builder. I've never built anything. I've never developed anything. I am a owner, owner on Swanee Lane, which is part of the uh, nomination. Uh, I am a resident on that street for the past 36 and a half years, a longtime resident. The nomination that I put forward is fully supported by all seven of the homeowners there at the entrance of Swanee Lane. This is a 100% consolidation, something that's unheard of in Fairfax County uh, planning circles. Let me repeat that, it's a 100% consolidation. In the early 2000s, Christopher Company put the, the southeast quadrant of the Nutley 66 interchange under contract. Uh, to develop uh, as single family homes, uh, as you can see uh, there in the diagram. Uh, their initial thought was the seven homes at the entrance of Swanee Lane um, were just valuable enough. They're, these are homes that were built in the mid fifties. They're, they're split level uh, homes that were built in the mid fifties. It, when they started the project, they decided they didn't believe it was economically viable to acquire that property and build new homes on the site. Uh, they went through the out of plan amendment process and the zoning process simultaneously. They were granted uh, four, uh, four to five dwelling units uh, per acre. Uh, and that's what, how they built a community. As soon as they started selling uh, houses in, in 2004, John Regan, one of the owners of Christopher and Company, I had a conversation with him and he, 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 he was lamenting the fact, you know, we should have picked up those other seven homes. We could have easily done it. These homes, uh, because of its proximity and walking distance to the Metro uh, are selling for a premium. And uh, he, he regretted having done that. When the zoning process and the planning process was going through, the planning staff came to Christopher and Company and practically insisted that they pick up those seven homes. And Christopher and Company persuaded the staff and said, well, it, economically, we can't do it. Well, the situation has changed. The only entrance to phase one of Briarwood Trace is that entrance at Swanee Lane and Nutley Street, which is directly across the street from the entrance to the uh, Vienna Metro. Uh, that's the only way you get back in there. Right now, you're accessing a high density area for four to five, which is, is uh, phase one of Briarwood Trace through a low density area. A, uh, a blatant violation of standard planning principles that was permitted in the early 2000s. All I'm asking here is that this error be corrected by allowing Briarwood Trace Homeowners Association to develop 
out to Nutley Street in the same manner as phase one of Briarwood currently exists and has existed for the last 19 to 20 years. That, that, that in, is in sum uh, what I'm proposing here. These are not townhouses, they're not garden apartments, these are single family homes. Now the previous nomination, which is the same distance from the Metro, they're proposing 65 to 80 dwelling units per acre. My proposal is four to five, which is consistent with phase one of Briarwood Trace. I'd be happy to enter any, entertain any questions that people might have. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, we'll start with the first name on the list, uh, Linda. Thank you. Um, I hadn't realized I'd quite raised my hand yet. Anyway. Um, Could you state your full name, please, for the record? Why, thank you, Jim. I think you know who I am, Linda Smith. How are you? There's only one name appearing on the screen. It says Linda. So, no, I don't know who you are. Oh, thank you. Well, I just gave my name. So, anyway, I, I think that, first of all, this nomination has a lot of history, um, going back probably 30 years. We, I would say that I have some different recollections from what you do, Jim. But anyway, one of the concerns that I see with this nomination is while you're talking about extending Briarwood Trace, the conditions that you have in your nomination are actually contrary to the way Briarwood Trace was developed. Um, you talk about wanting to waive a lot of the setback requirements, minimum parcel assemblage, payment of profits and the like, the transportation improvements. But in fact, Briarwood Trace is characterized by the current plan language and all the requirements in that that talk about things like usable quality open space, setbacks, distance between houses, and, and all of those things are in the current comprehensive plan, and that's the way Briarwood Trace out. Now, it also talks about buffering to the existing neighborhood and spacing of the units to comply with that. So what I would say here is that your nomination has a different vision than what Briarwood Trace the way Briarwood Trace was developed and the way the neighborhood, total Briarwood neighborhood, discussed all these things many years and the compromise that we reached when Briarwood Trace one and two were actually a Thank you, Mrs. Smith. Um, it Next, we have uh, Michael. I wasn't sure if I was on the list. Uh, this is Michael Ramirez. I live in Briarwood Trace. Units, as I look at this drawing, 15, 16, and 17 are in the existing stormwater management pond area. What is the plan for that? Uh, Planning for stormwater management uh, facility is part of the zoning process. It's not uh, part of the comprehensive plan uh, process. That would be determined and laid out when a builder okay. comes in. I should also state that there is no builder in the wings or developer in the wings. The seven homeowners simply would like to get this area replanned so that Briarwood Trace HOA can be finished out to Nutley Street. And I speak as someone who was on the board of the Briarwood Trace Homeowners Association for 15 years. Well, it, I mean, that stormwater management pond is frequently at capacity. I don't think you can put three homes and, and uh, reduce the size of that stormwater management pond. And we particularly have a problem with the recent uh, 66 development. 
Uh, you state that it's at uh, full capacity. Where are you getting that information from? I, 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 I see it study? regularly. I, I live near it. I see it daily. I, I live adjacent to it. Yes, I live adjacent to it, and I don't see it as at full capacity. Uh, speaking I'm not an engineer, if you're, are you an engineer? Speak, speak. I'm, I'm sorry. To, to, tonight is is not really to debate um, these particular items because we're we're talking about the the comprehensive plan. Correct. But I, I, just to to answer your question, Michael, that third bullet point that uh, you were discussing is, is basically one of the things that would have to be planned for and it, the the need to demonstrate that a site of this size could support proper site lay a, a proper site layout lot, lot sizes and adequacy of supporting amenities and facilities speaks to to a need for any development proposal to to show that the area is that the area you're you're planning to redevelop or re, or replan can do all those things so uh, that could that would be something that we would try to get try to get answers from Mr. Clark on as far as how he would handle the stormwater, you know, handle stormwater management for redeveloped lots with yeah. at a at a higher density during the during the planning process. It's, it's not something that would that would be held out until the zoning process because it, it it's something in, in having that discussion. It, it also becomes something that we also need to know just how far any conditional conditional requirements of a of a plan option to go to a higher density would be reflected in the comprehensive plan that okay, that's that's what that's what the site that's what the site specific when, when you do a site specific plan amendment that that's what ends, ends up happening we look at any potential constraints on the sites and say that whoever develops that site has to overcome all those obstacles so in the end what looks like 17 lots in this uh sketch that you're looking at now could could be reduced to to 10 maybe because you know because some somewhere along the line, someone has to establish that everything that needs to be done on this site can be handled for redevelopment can be handled within the site and it doesn't create any larger impacts out into the neighborhood and, and or into the greater community. It, it, it's kind of like schools, you know, you, you, you need to check your stormwater capacity just like you need to make sure that you aren't putting schools over capacity with some of the other with some of the other things and, and that, that's all stuff that the planning commission the board of supervisors and county staff considers if it becomes a plan if it becomes a plan amendment and before okay. before it gets into zoning great thank you you're welcome uh, mr jefferson i see you have your hand raised again oh he just lowered his hand uh no no so, i I'm actually sorry oh, Stephen. Oh. I was trying to do the mute, but technically I pressed the wrong button. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I, thought, I, thought you, I, thought you, I thought you disappeared. I thought you disappeared. No, no, no. And and I want to uh, uh, apologize because I was a little sloppy earlier. Uh, so I'm the the chair of the board for the Briarwood Trace Homeowners Association, and what uh, what Jim uh, and the other six owners have proposed was presented to the uh, residents at our annual meeting, December eighth, over at the Providence Community Center. Uh, Jim was kind enough to, to spend an evening with us and talk to us about the contours of, of, of the vision. And we understand, you know, he's not a developer and all that. Um, we see some attributes that are uh, quite worthwhile in changing the zoning. Um, you know, basically what ha what's happening now is there's a fiction um, in the sense that, uh, you know, the residents currently pay a fee for, uh, you know, snow removal. Uh, but when those plows come through, they plow uh, all of Swanee basically up because we have they have to you know let us get out of the neighborhood and Swanee is a main thoroughfare. So that you know uh, one attribute here is that if this if all seven parcels are redeveloped, at the very least um, the, the 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 and then those parcels are made part of the HOA. Uh, at the very least. Uh, we would align what actually happens uh, in, in practice with uh, the finances um, because now you'd have homeowners lining the front of Swanee who would be paying for the services that you know they currently receive. Uh, there would also be a unifying of, of uh, garbage collection um, uh, and perceptibly less uh, traffic from those vehicles in and out of the neighborhood because rather than 
coming, you know, twice, you're only coming one time a week uh, because they're getting the entire neighborhood. Uh, and then the other thing that uh, was attractive about it is, you know, uh, and, and I think Jim in a prior conversation mentioned this, you know, there's nothing prohibiting these seven homeowners uh, from, you know, selling their properties individually uh, and having those properties put to a use that's permitted in the zoning, whether it be somebody demolishing the house and building a new one of some design that, you know, uh, we have no input in or, or, or no uh, um, real uh, um, privy to. Um, and so this kind of allowing these properties to become uh, part of the HOA pursuant to proffers that would ensure that, you know, they are in conformance with the remaining homes. Uh, those are aspects that we appreciate. Um, so, you know, I wanted to, uh, you know, speak on this. I, I totally understand the, um, the bullets on the screen and certainly those things need to be worked out. Uh, Mr. Ramirez, uh, I, I hear you loud and clear as well about the flooding issue. Um, that was, uh, you know, something that was isolated to the I-66 redevelopment project. Uh, they, you know, did a bunch of construction and didn't install the proper drainage. And, you know, we worked with them to urgently address it. And you may remember they put pumps out that same day we had uh, that big storm. And now those problems have been resolved uh, because I agree with you, it's, it was unprecedented. Uh, and certainly whatever happens or if anything happens going forward with respect to redevelopment of those properties, um, you know, we'll ensure that, uh, you know, all the drainage issues are, are, are dealt with. Um, but, you know, the, the, the last point I would make is that, you know, from an HOA perspective, uh, you know, our job as a board is to, um, you know, minimally maintain the property values as best we can or do the, do the things that we can to, 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 to maintain them. Uh, but if we see an opportunity to perhaps enhance the values, then, you know, we got to take a serious look at it. Um, and we see this as one of those opportunities that um, uh, helps us at least maintain our property values and, and may actually enhance because you're talking about, you know, brand new homes that are, you know, some 20 years, you know, uh, younger than the homes we, we're in. Okay. Well, I, I thank you for your comments. Um, Could I follow up on uh, one of Dwayne's comments? Uh, sure. And it's not directly germane to this planning process. And the, the point is, is that uh, I simply point out back in 2004, before the downturn uh, in real estate in the mid 2000s, the individual that was the architect for Briarwood Trace who designed those homes came in and talked to the seven lot owners at the entrance of Swanee Lane. And he put forward a proposal where he wanted to buy all seven houses, tear them down, and as of right, without any subdivision, resubdivision or zoning, he was going to put up Mediterranean style homes with a, 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 a swimming pool behind each one and sell them for even back then, 1.5 million. Uh, and I think that's what Dwayne was alluding to. There needs to be some pressure left off, uh, le uh, released from, from the planning for this particular place. Otherwise, I suspect before there's another planning amendment rolling around, you may find homes built there as of right. And Briarwood Trace HOA is not going to have any say whatsoever, which would be tragic. As someone who sat on that board for 15 years and was interested uh, in maintaining a high quality neighborhood, that would be tragic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, I think we will. Uh, I, I see M Michael has your Michael has his hand up one more time, but I'm not sure if it's left over from the last time. No, no. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. OK, uh, OK, thank you. Uh, so so next we will move on to the next nomination. Thank, thank you for your time and helping to answer questions, Mr. Clark. Thank you very much. So next we'll begin to, to discuss the three Maryfield Suburban Center nominations. But first I wanted to take a look at this map that shows the location 
of each of the three nominations overlaid with the suburban center cores, uh, areas adjacent to the cores, non-core areas, and edges. The pink core areas are planned to have the most intense levels of, of development or redevelopment in an urban character. And then yellow areas adjacent to the cores are planned to step down to lower intensities than in the core, but still retain urban development character. The bluish gray non-core areas are uh, recommended to redevelop at lower suburban intensities, similar to the to the existing development that is uh, that had already that has already taken place throughout much of uh, Maryfield. The green edges, the green e edges areas are uh, there to provide transitions into the lower density suburban uh, suburban neighborhoods outside of uh, Maryfield. So now we'll zoom in to review the first nomination, the first Maryfield nomination, which is nomination PR006 for the Alliance Center condominiums. This subject site is planned at the baseline for industrial and office uses up to, five, up to 0 0.50 FAR. And it also has two plan options for higher intensities contributing to the town center core to the town center core area vision. Option one allows office and retail uses up to 0.65 FAR. And option two is for residential mixed uses up to 1.2 FAR. The nomination is proposed residential mixed uses up to 3.0 FAR as multifamily residential with ground floor commercial uses. If added to the work program, then plan then the planning staff, the, the county staff's preliminary considerations are that redevelopment of this infill site should consider how it can be integrated with previously approved development applications that meet goals for the town for the for promoting the, the town center concept. However, because there are no other parcels available to achieve consolidation with this site. At a larger scale, the land use pattern, building forms, streetscape, and other essential elements should demonstrate compatibility with the high quality urban, urban design care characteristics that are found throughout the adjacent Mosaic district. Furthermore, any proposal, any redevelopment proposal should demonstrate that the development on the subject site would not negatively impact the current balance of open space amenities and facilities required to serve existing core existing land uses within the town center core. And the nominator Steve Teets has joined us tonight to discuss the proposal for nomination uh, PR006. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Steve. Uh, and, and if you if you have a uh, if you have a presentation, please feel free to share. If not, uh, we, we can take a look at this map where you're uh, showing where where your uh, site is. Uh, circled and located in the Maryfield core. That that works fine, Steve, and thank you very much for the um, for the introduction and uh, thank you for everybody for listening here this evening. I will thank uh, Miss Jill Parks for explaining to everybody what this uh, comprehensive plan site amendment thing is and tell you it's not zoning and I as, as great as Evan was in that very first one with all of his detail, uh, all we have right now is a concept sketch of showing what uh, a couple of uh, similar buildings to the uh, Maryfield Town Center Mosaic District uh, would look like. Um, I represent the Alliance Condominiums. Um, we, they are owners and have been owners in there for almost 50 years. Um, there are uh, 24 different uh, landowners that own multiple units in there. And uh, what I've done is, and Ms. Smith, it's on the call and staff knows that I was uh, the lead person for Edens as far as in all the um, zonings of the Mosaic District. So. When I talk about this in relationship to the Mosaic District, you understand you're getting it as close to the horse's mouth as you're going to get. Um, the this proposal is very similar 
and so uh, well, not it's not very similar, but James Clark's one was interesting the way he talked about his. But this proposal is um, really clearing up something. I think that the comprehensive plan for this core area, as uh, Steve had showed you, we are actually in this property is right within the uh, town center core area. It's not adjacent, doesn't really isn't a part, it's part of the core because it literally it backs right up to uh, Mosaic and right in, next to the um, EYA uh, phase two of their townhouses. So it's right along Eskridge Road, which is a spine road for the area. And the vision of the plan has always been a certain massing, but, and I, I'm going to uh, digress a second for you all that all of a sudden think that I'm, that we're, that the Alliance condo and the owners there are asking for something dramatic by moving from a 1.2 to a 3.0. The 1.2 that's envisioned in the, um, in the comprehensive plan as the current states was looking at, uh, these consolidations you've heard, uh, taking a bunch of different pieces of property and then starting to to put streets in it to to build the uh, parking areas if it's parking decks or however that was going to work to to provide parks and those elements. What we have here with the Alliance condo within this block, if you if you're familiar with this going down Eskridge Road, these are the old office condos there that are, are right there, it's, it can't be consolidated right now. The only piece of property that could be brought into this is the, um, the uh, antenna, the, the big satellite dish in the, fair, the, the Fairfax County access. There's a, there's a cable access uh, thing there. There's a bunch of wire, trust me. There's so much uh, facilities, Verizon and all different elements running into that air into that property it's it's just not feasible we we tried as edens for years to figure out how to do that we just couldn't come up with it so this parcel sits on its own what's interesting about this parcel is there's an alley already built to the east that serves the back of the mill creek townhouses i think they're called the madera now these days. There's townhouses just to the south and Eskridge Road, which was built by uh, Edens when we developed the, mosa the mosaic. Uh, that whole road had to be developed and had to be built all the way to its uh, to where then it, it picked up and got, uh, got finished out all the way uh, through. So um, this parcel is kind of a leftover, but what that does is because of the vision of the of the comprehensive plan and their initial 1.2, they were thinking this for much bigger areas. So this area, when you consolidate it down, literally is, it, it, if it gets developed at a 1.2, it, it wouldn't look the way the mosaic would look. It wouldn't look like the Mill Creek. It wouldn't look like the Avalons. It's, um, it's a density level that, that the town center actually, and Steve and Graham can verify this, is that will tell you is that they want to see up to 90 feet. They want to see some height in there. This is, it's adjacent to that big parking deck. And if you built that up to, if you build a, just a standard multifamily apartment complex in there, you would, <laughs> you would get to a 3.0 uh, floor area ratio is what it would, you would build 420,000 square feet and that would get into that area of that same height mass. So the request here is, um, I'm not asking, we're not asking for a different use type of thing. We're not asking for anything for height. We're, we're not asking to go into another part of the zone. There's nothing in this other than to say this particular parcel doesn't fit the language set up in the original um, uh, comprehensive plan at the 1.2. This, this and, and I will say also, I'll give you some comparable numbers. The Avalon Bay parcel is a, is if you just take that parcel itself, like this would be, is at, at a 3.6. So, um, 
we're right next to amenities. We're less than a mile from the metro station. We are a, um, but at this point in time to, uh, to tell you that we have a developer on board like EYA and the fancy pictures, do we know what we're gonna do? No, we're more like Jill said, this is a comprehensive plan. We, we only know we can build 1.2 and that, that just seems, doesn't seem good for this area. So the owners of these condos wanna go ahead and see if we can get 3.0. And that effectively is it. And I will also say, I, I know I'm supposed to reach out to some um, uh, Jason owners. I've gotten a list from Fairfax County just as of um, the end of last week, early this week. And I will be available to, uh, to start those conversations to talk about any concerns you all have. And again, I just want to point out, I know Mosaic, I know the area, I did, I've, uh, worked on it and I think this is just an, a logical progression to that and thank you all much for the opportunity to present it to you. Thank you Steve. Um, so once again we will open the floor up to any questions from the community. Any, uh, are there any neighbors who are who are there? Any Anyone who frequents the uh, Mosaic District, or uh, any any other interested parties or stakeholders, and if not, uh, seeing no hands raised, if not, we can move on to the next nomination. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you too, Steve. Hold on, so, Steve. Uh, or Stephen, one second. There's a. Uh, it looks like there's a Brooks Stevens that was trying to raise their hand. That are that's here. Okay. I had a question. Okay, Brooke. Uh, uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Thanks. I guess my um, application, the, the hand raising, wasn't going through. Um, but so I, I'm a homeowner. Um, within walking distance of, uh, of Mosaic District. And uh, myself and many of my neighbors treat this area as kind of like our, our town center, uh, kind of like it was envisioned. And, um, you know, we, we are there multiple times every week and we, we walk there, we bike there, we drive there. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to express some um, support for this uh, specific uh, plan amendment um, uh, proposed that, um, you know, this area, this neighborhood developed, um, at a pretty rapid pace. And there's some, there's some awkward growing pains, I think that have gone along with that. And then this, this plot right here is, is one of those areas. Um, you know, there, there's a lot going on around here. It's very people centric in most parts of this. But you know this stretch of Eskridge Road. There's a lot of people um, who who use this, uh, using all kinds all kinds of modes. Um, but you know you have the USPS facility across the street, but you also have the uh, the caboose um, facility, which is very popular, and people crossing back and forth from Mosaic to there. And um, I, I think there's some big opportunities for. Um, improvements um, to the area that are more people oriented. I think bringing um, this development and redeveloping this plot, it, it would hopefully, you know, get rid of what's mostly surface parking um, now and um, make it more people oriented. I think that there would, could be some opportunities in redeveloping this plot um, to add in some amenities that face Eskridge Road um, for pedestrians and 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 cyclists and and all other road users, um, but yeah, I also I also just think this is a very logical um, amendment at the recommended density levels um, that that should be strongly considered. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank Brooks. you, Brooks. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Well. Uh... Seeing no other raised hands at this point, I will uh, move to the next project. 
nomination P R O O eight for Maryfield at the Dunlor at Dun at Dunloring Station Apartments. The subject site is at the northeast boundary of the Maryfield uh, Suburban Center, and it abuts the I-66-495 interchange. The site is currently developed with 706 low and mid-rise multifamily dwelling units known as Maryfield at the Dunlor <laughs> the Maryfield at Dunloring Station Apartments. At the baseline, the adopted comprehensive plan recommends residential uses up to 16 to 20 dwelling units per acre. This site is also has an alternative plan option for redevelopment as a mix of residential uses up to 20 to 30 dwelling units per acre mixed with auto with mixed with non auto auto oriented retail and service uses up to 1.2 FAR. And I also note on the map, the blue line represents a planned connection for for the a, a, a completion of the connection of a ring road that's planned for the Maryfield Suburban Center. So the nomination proposes an increase in the planned development potential. Oh, I'm sorry. The nomination, the nomination proposes an increase in the plan development potential that could allow as much as twice the number of residential units that are currently planned for the site. And therefore, if a plan amendment is appropriate, then staff's preliminary considerations identify the need to preserve or replace the existing stock of affordable housing that is currently located on the site, on this site since it's so close to the metro station. And additionally, the increased the increased density and building height should be configured in a way that achieves compatible transitions into the adjacent sites that are developed at lower intensities and densities. Additionally, a plan to redevelop the subject site should ensure that the proposal would not negatively impact the current balance of open space, parks, and similar amenities serving land uses in the transit station core and core adjacent areas. So uh, those are staff's considerations, and we also have attending them with us tonight, Tony Calabrese, who will present the nominators over, overview for the proposal. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate the uh, the introduction. I'm uh, Tony Calabrese with DLA Firm out of Reston. I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me, please. Well, I find it. Two more. Yes. I'm looking for it. I don't know why it's not showing up. I had this problem the other night as well. And, Graham and Tony, it's Stephanie with Land Design. Need me to share my screen. No, Jennifer's got it. Jen, you on? I I have it also. Yeah. So I, if if Jen doesn't, if Jen isn't prepared to share, I can open. She she shared it with me just so we'll you'll have multiple backups. So. Yeah. I need them. There's something about teams that just literally won't let me pull up a PowerPoint. Let me browse my computer. I, I have do, it here. Yeah, you, too. OK, Is that um, working? Let's see. Hold on a second, guys. Let me see oh. if this works. OK, I do you want me to you stop? got it. Oh, OK, I'll stop then. All right, Jan, yeah, if you can blow that up, just, yeah, just put Jan, the full screen sharing. up. Thank you so much. Sorry for the uh, quick technical challenges. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm really excited about the opportunity to present to the 67 remaining participants. I think we started at 99. Uh, kudos, props to staff. I know they're running around everywhere in the county doing this. And, and frankly, um, thanks to the, to the many participants in the Providence District. This is a really exciting area. I grew up in Bailey's Crossroads in the Mason District. We would only occasionally trek to the old movie theater here. And frankly, what the county has accomplished in Mosaic, credit to a lot of different folks, not, uh, not the least of which is, is Supervisor Smith, if she's still on, former Supervisor Smith, is a, is a really vibrant, vital, walkable, transit-oriented mixed-use development in Mosaic. Um, and that's uh, that's an extraordinary change. 
And in no small part, that change resulted in exactly, and, and the, the, the inception of it was really exactly what we're doing this evening, which is a long-term visioning for a really exciting area. As reflected here, we've got about 35 acres. Many of you are probably familiar with the Merrifield Apartments. They've been there since 1968. Uh, we're at the, the confluence of 495 to the east, running north-south, of course, 66, Metro, Fairview Park, uh, the Innova Empire, and, and many other areas. And Mosaic, you see a mom's organic uh, reflected there. The, virtually the entire site is basically within a third of, of a mile. Uh, of Metro. Let's go to the next slide. I'll, I'll do this with alacrity because I know we're getting late and I know there, there will be uh, lots of opportunity for follow up. If you can go to the next slide, Jen. I think the slide might be frozen. Is it not advancing? No, no it's not. Okay. Quit, quit, interesting. Push to the left. Um, go to the left and try it. Uh, let me try to. Uh, let's you, see here. It, you might have you might have better luck uh, sharing the PDF. There you go. Yeah. Living now. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Now Did you, I go too you, many slides up? Yeah, just go over to the left and hit number two, and that should do it. Go, there Is you it go. on? There you go. That's number two. Okay. So uh, again, I'll do this quickly. Thirty-five acres. It's part of the TSA. It's five ten-minute walk. Uh, it's in the Maryfield Commercial Revitalization Area. And again, many of you are probably familiar with about 700 apartments in this quadrant. Next slide, Jen. Number three. So one of the things that Stephen quickly alluded to that's imbued in the graphics, hard to see admittedly, is this ring road through the western portion of Gallows. I think it's really important and we definitely want to participate. Self-evidently transportation, critically important issue, affordable housing, school impacts. We're excited to address and prepared to address any of, and all of those topics as part of this SSPA process. I think there's some really interesting things which can happen in this quadrant. If you go to number four, we, while we have some seemingly definitive plans, these are just plans, these are concepts. These are to try and impart some intriguing ideas by the ownership. We've had this property for, for I think 50 years now and land design out of Old Town, many of you are familiar with their great work throughout the region uh, of critically important open spaces, creating a vibrant community that's walkable uh, and doing um, some really unique and complementary things in an area that frankly needs some attention. Very quickly, what's shown on the right side are, are different housing. I'll talk about the transition in density that Stephen alluded to in just a minute. I think senior living, as you heard a couple of applications ago is, is a very uh, appropriate for consideration in this area. Frankly, we have a lot of retirees who love Northern Virginia and want to stay in Northern Virginia. They want to downsize. Uh, as we'll get to in a minute, this particular owner is renowned literally for environmental sensitivity, solar panel, uh, electric cars and infrastructure, and, and other things that are very much consistent with plan objectives. Let's go to number five. We start to get a flavor for the transition area. Again, in the northeast corner in that upper dark blue, we're right up against, of course, the ramp from 66 uh, heading south and the very new, newly opened interchange. This is an appropriate place, in our opinion, to have a higher density. You're quite close to Metro, easily walkable. Um, there's nothing particularly attractive as you drive past the site on any of these roads. We think creating an, an entrance, uh, something really noteworthy, uh, an appropriate uh, development of residential in this area would be very helpful. Uh, you can see the transition down from the north to the middle of the property and then to the lower densities, townhomes and so forth that would comport with the properties to the south. We'll come to that green area at the bottom right here in just a minute. So these are the concepts that we'd like to review with the Providence District and with staff. Number six. The streetscape character, the multimodal amenities, this might be a little bit hard to see, Jen, I don't know if you can blow that up, but proximity to Metro, having a bike trail, which you can see kind of in the, in the upper graphics there on the right-hand side, pedestrian friendly, shared use paths on both sides of the street, uh, segways, a lot of people are, are using those, 
Um, anything bicycles, self-evidently, anything to get people out of single occupancy vehicles is, is a critical part of the application and what we think we can achieve on this property. Next. Again, community amenities. Um, somebody, the previous speaker talked about walking to the mosaic caboose, which I've been to a whole bunch. Um, you know, just doing neat little things like the checkers and chess pieces, they have a caboose. I play that every time I go. Really being thoughtful about integrating open spaces, community gathering places. Uh, this little labyrinth that you see is incredibly popular. That's, that's actually a development not too far from here. The kids literally play in that all day, every day. So land design and the owner have really started giving some thought to how do we create these wonderful places, frankly, that are not just for the community that could be developed here, but uh, for the totality of the surrounding areas. Next, only got a couple more slides. There's a Southern Park concept. Uh, there in the bottom right, you see the 1.0 acre. That's actually owned by the Fairfax County Park Authority, the Heartland Park. Uh, it's right up against the toll road. It's, it's right up against the sound barrier. And they do have some nice plans. We have talked to, we met with the Park Authority uh, we'd like to complement what they have in mind and create a combination of some neat active areas, pickerball, volleyball. You see the, the spray area for the kids. I know my kids always used to love to run through those things. A noteworthy community park that is a, is a real anchor in the southeast corner of this property. Again, not only for the benefit of this community, but that would be a public park and something that I think could uh, really be attractive and uh, beneficial to the area. Next. I think we only got two slides left. We've already started thinking about schools. A lot of speakers tonight have asked the, you know, the insightful question, what we're gonna do more residential, what's the impact on schools? A number of the proposed housing types that we're talking about would generate relatively few kids. But having said that, you know, we're very familiar with Shrevewood, Kilmer and Marshall. As many of you know, there's the new Dunloring Elementary School. It's gonna be built just to the north. That's gonna add significant additional capacity. And we can go to the next slide. But building upon the success of Mosaic, frankly, the vitality increase in property values in the surrounding area uh, has really been a benefit, I think, for everyone in this region, not without its challenges, uh, but really some noteworthy benefits. I'm not going to go through any of this. If you, if you will, write down that upper left uh, website, www.esrteit.com. And Jen, if you don't mind, can you Copy that, put that in the chat and add your email as well uh, to make sure that if, as folks have questions. Empire State Realty have been the 40, 50 year owner of this property. They are an incredibly impressive, accomplished organization. I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that. Take five minutes, look at their website, learn more about them. And I think you'll be pleased that they wanna be a great corporate citizen. Next and possibly last. Almost last. I'm not going to go through all this. These are a series of uh, bullets, uh, provisions, excerpts from the economic success um, strat strategic plan, one Fairfax, the county strategic plan. And if you look through any of those bullets, every one of them is directly applicable to what we'd like to achieve on this property. Uh, we're happy to share this, Stephen, by the way, if, if folks want to get a copy of it later. And now I think we're at the last slide, hopefully. Yep, that's it. So we are really pleased, honored, and excited about the fact that the ownership, now having had this property, they're actually spending some nice money to rehab and an upgrade a number of the uh, apartments here. But they have some really interesting and a long-term vision that I think absolutely comports with both the existing concepts of the comprehensive plan, the economic vitality of this area. Um, you you, you want to have areas enjoy investment. And this would be an extraordinary long-term vision. This would not happen overnight. It would take many years. It'll take a lot of planning. It'll take a whole zoning. Uh, but we're really excited and proud to be part of this process. So, Stephen, I'll be quiet and be happy. I see a couple of hands up. Um, be happy to answer questions. All right. Thank you, Tony. Um, so first up, we have Sonia Brihi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah. Yep. Brihi, that's great. Uh, Sonia Brihi, um, I will say um, I am with the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Um, I wanted to just say that I think this is a great proposal that I support moving forward in this process. This area 
with its proximity to Metro should absolutely have more density. Um, I'm glad to see it being proposed. Uh, it's great to hear about the multimodal improvements with the grid of streets and improvements to walking and biking in this area. Um, it's already, you're starting to see the transformation with more and more folks walking in that area. And I think this would just be a great, great benefit. Um, I also like that there's a sustainability focus to the building designs and that there will be, you know, providing publicly accessible open space. I did want to mention, I am concerned about the potential of losing what I think are market rate affordable housing that currently exists there um, and the displacement of the residents that live there. Um, that's not to say that, you know, this should I think we may have lost Sonia. Are, are, are you still there? I got dropped, but I think I'm back now. Um, okay. So I guess what I wanted to ask is um, what will be done to ensure replacement of the affordable housing in that area? And will anything be done to help the residents who want to stay in that area? Because it, it is a really lovely garden style apartment complex now, um, but it, it does need more density with that proximity to Metro. So I just wanted to ask about the sort of affordability question. Thank Ms. you. Brie, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ms. Brehe. I'm very familiar with your organization, spent a lot of time with uh, Stuart Schwartz and, and other colleagues. So uh, make sure you get Jennifer's email. Hopefully it's in the chat. I can't see it at the moment. Delighted to follow up with you. We're very focused on uh, taking care of the residents that are there and, and doing the right thing. Uh, the staff is, Supervisor Palchek is. So a lot of discussion will be focused on the issue that you raised at the end. I absolutely agree with your your. Uh, introductory remarks, and I appreciate those very much. So I look forward to following up with you, ma'am. And Sonia, um, this is Graham Owen with Department of Planning and Development. I would just reiterate um, that the uh, county is actually conducting a um, affordable housing preservation uh, policy plan amendment as we speak. Um, I believe that the staff report for that initiative, which is a countywide initiative, uh, is either going to be is going to be released or has already been released um, in advance of a planning commission hearing, uh, which will be coming up uh, in February. So that's looking at some specific instances of um, you know preserving the affordability of market rate, what we call a, a market affordable units, and those are kind of geared at uh, typically um, uh, units that are rented at uh, rented to households that are earning 60% of the area median income and below. So it's kind of a specific specific thing, but I think, you know, when, when we're looking at, um, you know, the potential for, you know, a plan, a plan amendment to um, replace units, you know, I think that, that is a, it's, it's something that we'll need to take into consideration if this is added to the work program in particular. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone. Uh, next we have Fran. Hi there, this is Fran Wallingford. Um, I have two comments. The first uh, is related to schools and really I wanna address this to all the people that presented tonight. One of the things that happens is the schools are not there when the kids show up. The schools are always behind the ball. If there's something that staff can do to uh, put a recommendation in the comprehensive plan to make sure that the schools are available when the kids show up as opposed to two years later. So that's one concern. And the second has to do with stormwater, uh, mainly dealing with uh, Tony's nomination in the Merrifield area. Uh, downstream from uh, that area, we have a lot of uh, stormwater issues. Uh, most of Merrifield comes into Pine Ridge and Mantua, and we have issue after issue with uh, all kinds of erosion going on, uh, storm water, um, sanitary sewer access points that are in the middle of the creek. So whatever is being done and developed there, please have consideration of what's downstream and not stop at your borders. Ms. Wallenford, it's, uh, it's nice to hear your voice again. I don't, I don't see your lovely face, but um, we've already got engineers on board and we're actually already studying that issue. I appreciate you Great. highlighting it and a lot more to learn about it. Yes, ma'am. Glad to work with you, Tony. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am.
Thank you. Next is uh, Ryan Watkins. Hello, I'm Ryan Watkins. I'm the HOA board president for Vienna Crossing Community, which are the townhomes just to the west side of the medium gray or medium green area. Um, so we haven't yet had an opportunity to talk with the current proposal about 15 years or so ago. Um, another proposal was brought to us um, that was then later scrapped, I guess, and looked quite a bit different than what's being proposed now with much higher densities now. Um, I think that as the county has already noted, that transition from, I guess we're um, four or five level of townhouse community density to being right on top of us as what he has is a six to eight floor um, high density unit. Um, we would have concerns about that um, being 10 feet from our back door, it appears. Um, but we know this is just the beginning of the planning process and we look forward to um, working with both the county as well as the developer and the owners of the community behind us to see how we can best accomplish what's good for everyone in the area. Mr. Watkins, it's a, it's a pleasure to meet you. Please make sure that you grab Jennifer's email. Please send us yours. We'd be really excited to come in and, and meet with you. You may recognize me since I've driven through your neighborhood about 15 times over the last six months. So. I'm, I'm not a stalker, no need to report any of the police, but uh, we, 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 we're, we have, can you put yourself on mute? So thank you, sir. Uh, we'd really like the opportunity to meet with you. We're very sensitive to proximity. It's not 10 feet off the property line, I can assure you. And uh, as you can see, we're very intentional about trying to transition down uh, to exactly where you live. So we look forward to, uh, we look forward to following up with you soon. Great. Um, I did try the website that you had up a couple minutes ago, and it did not work. I tried it on two computers. Um, so if you could post maybe the emails into the chat room, then we can go that way. Yeah. Since the Jen, did you already did you post your email? I I on mute. I did. Yes. Stephen, not to delay this, but I want to make sure we get Mr. Watkins' contact information. Uh, Ryan, can you let us know if you see Jennifer's or if not, just tell us a phone number and, or email and we'll follow up with you, sir. I don't see it in chat, but I'll have to scroll to the bottom probably. Um, we'll get in touch. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, th thanks again, everyone. Um, if there are no additional questions, we will now I'll begin to share my screen again, and then we can uh, take a look at the next and final nomination for Maryfield and of the night. So with the final proposal that we'll be screening tonight is nomination uh, PR007, and it's for the Prosperity Business Campus, at the, which is located at the northwest uh, corner of the Maryfield Suburban Center. The subject site consists of 14 parcels in the Prosperity Business Park, and uh, it can, comprises most of land unit D of the Maryfield Suburban Center. At the baseline, the entire site is planned for office and industrial uses at the currently established in intensities. And uh, there's also a large, a large parcel along the, the western border, as you can see shaded green here, that is recommended as private open space. The adopted plan currently provides options for redevelopment of subunit D2, which you see shaded in yellow. Option one would allow redevelopment with office and retail services, service uses up to 0.85 FAR, and redevelopment option two, which applies to uh, sub subunit D2 only, allows uh, residential mixed uses with development up to 1.35 FAR. So the nomination is proposing mixed use, uh, residential mixed use uh, development up to 1.35 FAR with bonus density with bonus density potential of up to 1.51 FAR, and 
what the what what the nomination is proposing is to basically uh, spread option two, uh, the second option that's allowed in, in subunit D two only throughout the entire site. So the proposal with this nomination it would expand urban level intensities from the core adjacent areas into the non-core areas that are uh, recommended to be to mainly consist of uh, suburban level in intensities that are similar to what is currently uh, established on, on on the sites in the in the gray blue for the core area. So staff's considerations prioritize the provision of compatible transitions to nearby lower density residential units to the west and also the potential of redevelop the potential for, for redevelopment could also uh, should also consider a means for retaining some of the compatible commercial and industrial uses that are currently established at the site. And it should also carefully consider that the nomination achieves broad, a broader vision for Maryfield, for the Maryfield Suburban Center to also be an employment center, and needs for improved circulation and connections with the core, within the core area, and also needs for improved circulation and connections with uh, amenities and uses in the core area, and also adequacy of parks and open space areas to support the prospective residents and uses of the site and also any broader needs for open space and, and parks throughout the Maryfield Suburban Center. Lastly, coordination with nearby areas near the core should should also be considered. So any so any future study in order to accommodate planned multimodal transportation improvements such as an east west connector road and pedestrian improvements and the provision of, of again the provision of adequate parks and open space and other facilities that would be needed to support uh intensified residential uses of the site so the nominators represent the nominations representative bernie suchacetal is here tonight to go to go over an overview of the nomination Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that uh, brief overview. Um, Happy New Year to everybody. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Let me pull up my presentation here. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Great, thank you. Um, Again, my name is Bernie Suchicito. I'm a land use planner with the firm Walsh Colucci, and I'm representing the nominator and property owner of the Prosperity Business Campus property uh, that is up for discussion tonight. Uh, Stephen gave a good summary of what we are proposing, so I'd like to give a brief presentation of a rather exciting proposal we have for you for this evening. Um, just a brief recap we are the nominated parcels are the area in front of you that are hatched in beige pink uh, stripes here uh, encompassing pretty much the vast majority of land unit d in the in the maryfield suburban center which is on the far western end of maryfield we have hilltop road to the south we have interstate 66 to the north Prosperity Avenue, which essentially bisects down the middle of the property, and we have Long Branch Stream Valley on the far western edge of the property. Uh, the one parcel that's not included is the Saudi Arabia um, Cultural Mission uh, Campus, uh, but the rest of the land unit is part of and owned by the Prosperity Business Campus owners. <clears throat> so what's there today right now? It's 41 acres. Uh, again, it's within close proximity to the metro station, and it's pretty much built up with a suburban style office use, office parks, and light industrial warehouse buildings. As you can see here from the images, it has a very suburban feel to Prosperity Avenue. Um, I used to live on in the townhome communities to the immediate west here 
uh, right where my cursor is, so I have a very good knowledge base of this neighborhood. Uh, there are residential townhomes immediately to the west on the other side of Long Branch Stream Valley, as well as townhome, residential townhomes to the south, and additional light industrial uh, warehouse buildings and some retail to the south, as well as light industrial buildings uh, to the east. There is an existing, uh, I think about a 13 story residential tower up against the northeastern corner of the property as you walk closer to the metro station. So the property again is about uh, half a mile from its closest edge to the Dunlory Merrifield metro station and about three quarters of a mile from its furthest point. It is about three quarters of a mile to the Mosaic District, which is off the screen here on the lower right hand side. Um, this is an evolving neighborhood, uh, pretty much west of Gallows Road. It's just, as you can see and visit and drive through there over the years, it's been slowly evolving from all the new development activity at the Merrifield Station, uh, to the Holstead, I think, is the name of this development here, just south of Prosperity Avenue. And this is just the next piece. Uh, what we're proposing here um, essentially is, as Stephen said, in a continuation of what you already see and what is already planned east of the site. Uh, <clears throat> we are asking to take the recommendations, the land use recommendations from the eastern side of Prosperity Avenue and continue it over to the west side, but in a more transitional manner as you can, we are looking at extending the existing block grid, the street grid uh, that's currently so far is in coming in pieces right now, but we're proposing to extend, I believe it's Mary, uh, Maryfield Avenue uh, across east and west and a future road uh, east-west at the bottom end of the property uh, with internal grid networks as well. Uh, we will have an extensive open space package across the entire property, not just individual parks uh, isolated here and there, but a network connecting the residential, the existing residential communities to the west and south through our property and towards the metro station, making a porous, continuous community. Uh, the idea is also to have development designed in a way that it helps screen uh, the residential and the other community aspects, elements from Interstate 66. In this concept, we're looking at uh, placing the garages, the parking garages for uh, potential multifamily buildings of three and four here up against 66 to act as the shielding elements. <clears throat> uh, what's also important here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I used to live in this community over here, right up against the Stream Valley Park, and I would walk up and then across the Stream Valley at a kind of a, a precarious uh, crossing point across the stream, I believe, uh, there's a concrete path that's pretty much submerged during heavy raining seasons. The idea is to relocate that further south and it create a more enjoyable experience for those commuters by foot who wants to commute from the residential homes to the from the west across through our property, through the new property, and then into into the Maryfield district towards the metro station creating a more pleasing experience for everyone involved. Uh, so getting into a little more details, uh, again, this is 41 acres. Um, what we're looking at is, uh, as you can see here, the biggest thing that pops out is green, a lot of green. We are proposing almost 13 acres of publicly accessible park space uh, on this site. Uh, it is going to be wrapped around uh, about uh, <clears throat> excuse me, seven blocks. Uh, we have multifamily buildings along Interstate 66 on the northern end, uh, blocks one, three, and four, and then another multifamily building in block two as it goes as you go down Prosperity Avenue. 
And then on the western side of Prosperity now, it the height and the density transitions downwards to blocks five and six to residential townhomes, which would be similar in keeping to the existing residential townhomes further west. And lastly, block seven at the bottom. Potentially, uh, the idea is to keep it as office, but with the option to redevelop it as a multifamily building as well. And as you can see here, we have quite a number of parks. Um, the intent is to, the request is to amend the comprehensive plan to go from, for subunit D1, to go from, as it states, existing planned, it's planned for existing intensities, and that's about a 0 0.3, 0 0.36 FAR, to mimic that what is in subunit D2, which is up to a 1.35 FAR. Um, the other uh, bonus to this is, as you know, the property is pretty much developed from one end to the other with surface lots and office buildings and light industrial. With redevelopment, as, especially with the amount of park acreage we're offering here, it creates the opportunity for improved stormwater management uh, for the area with the new development, as well with the, op the opportunity to provide an increase in associated affordable housing with this development. Uh, so both affordable housing and open space, which is something that is uh, in short supply in the Merrifield area, uh, could be delivered and proposed with this concept. So with that, um, I'm available to answer any questions that you may have, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Bert. Thanks, Bernie. Um, I see uh, at the top of the list we have Linda. Thank you again, Graham. Uh, looking at all of the Merrifield proposals, um, I'm seeing a lot more people, and nobody's proposed anything like new playing fields. I think we're going to need them. We don't. We only have the one at Luther Jackson. So what's going to happen about playing fields, Perry? Thank you, that uh, former supervisor, Lynn Smith. Um, uh, again, this is uh, an opportunity. I recognize your voice. I recognize your voice. Um, and as you can see, this is still conceptual. There's opportunities here to provide playing fields. Uh, and it again, it will be open to the general public. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity for not only Maryhill, but for Fairfax County to introduce potential park space in an area that's currently really doesn't, isn't planned for that and um, would actually be an improvement moving forward. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the bridge from the townhouses. Mm -hmm. that's, that's been a sore subject for so long. Thank you. Uh, I twisted my ankle there once um, trying to get across, getting to work. <laughs> Thanks, Bernie. Nice to see you. Uh, thanks. Uh, we'll move on to Brooks Stevens. Brooks Stevens. Oops. Hi. Um, so, Bernard, I live, I'm a homeowner in the neighborhood that you used to live in, um, the one with the uh, kind of sketchy pedestrian bridge there. Um, um, and I, I can't speak for the HOA, but I think a lot of them have feel the same sentiment as I do. But um, I think that um, this uh, proposed uh, plan amendment is very exciting. Yeah, and um, as uh, we would potentially be neighbors to a to a development like this, um, th this is something that I uh, would love to see, not just for the um, increased amenity of an improved um, path uh, from our neighborhood, which would, wouldn't would only go through this development, but would provide a better path for us to the metro, which is which is huge. Um, but also just the this this site is just very underutilized in its current land use 
uh, for its location. And I know that's a partly a product of just how quickly this area um, developed in the past couple of decades. Um, but um, yeah, housing, housing, housing. I think this neighborhood needs a lot more housing, whether it's um, whether it's dedicated affordable housing, market rate ho or market rate housing. Um, I, while I do and I do appreciate the uh, the proposed green spaces and the need for them, um, and and I, th I think those would be great. But um, yeah, I think this plan amendment um, should be very strongly considered as well. And I think the uh, the proposed connecting of the grid there is it just makes so much sense and and i think it would um that that needs to be um seen through as well thanks uh thank you mr stevens i really appreciate those comments and we look forward to continue engagement with your community um so please feel free to reach out to me uh, moving forward great thanks all right, I uh, don't see any additional questions. Um, and uh, for I, I'm, I'm sure that the Graham probably has some closing remarks, but uh, I just wanted to share my screen and thank everyone for attending tonight and providing your uh, your input and asking some well thought out questions. Um, to continue following along through the screening process, you can go to the county's SSPA track SSPA process track a nomination page and scroll down to the Providence District. And uh, here's where you'll see a, a, a list of all the Providence District nominations that have been screened tonight and the three additional ones that will be screened at meetings next week. And there's also community the community meeting information for those uh, for those additional meetings and you can look at the nominator location maps and also uh, contact us with the email address that, that Graham spelled out earlier uh, in the meeting is dpd sspa at fairfaxcounty.gov and as we've uh, stated a few times today this is the very early stage of the process and uh, we really look forward to hearing any more comments or concerns and if anyone needs to if anyone needs uh, additional um, information for direct contacts with the nominators we'll also we can also provide you with that information as well and uh, with that I'll turn it back over to Graham I'm sure you have a, a, a few more things to say and uh, I'll, I'll be really quick. Yeah, th thank you so much, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, I would just reiterate that this is the very beginning of the SSPA process. You know what we're doing right now is screening. Um, this is the first, you know, the first opportunity to learn about these nominations and provide comments, but it's certainly not the last. Um, so one thing I did want to uh, reemphasize, I think Steve had it earlier in the presentation, um, is the next formal step in the process uh, for these nominations is the planning commission workshop, and so. That's going to take place uh, in a series of meetings. Uh, they'll start Wednesday, uh, February the 22nd, and then I'll follow um, each week. We'll do one workshop. So the next one will be on Thursday the 2nd, followed by Thursday the 9th um, of March, and then um, also uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday the 15th. So um, a lot of opportunities to get involved in the review of the nominations and be part of the discussion with the Planning Commission about uh, priorities. Um, Bernie, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to take the opportunity to ask a question uh, with the planning commission workshops. Are they going to be grouped uh, each night? Is it going to be one district and then the next night, the next a different district? Or is it going to be a fluid conversation going in and out of the different districts with each of the nights? Yeah, it's a good question. I think we're, we're most likely going to need to group them um, by by supervisor district, but I think that there will be an opportunity for it to, you know, to go across across lines. I don't think we're going to have like just a Providence night or just a Mason District night. Um, it really kind of depends on, uh, you know, the, the number of comments that we get and also, um, you know, the, the ordering in terms of, you know, which nominations are we going to be reviewing and which nights. 
we're working on those details right now um, and we'll be releasing more information about that basically in the next week or so. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll post more information on the tracking nomination website and, and, all, and also if, if you want to touch base um, in a one on one, happy to do so. Looks like we got, got a couple of other questions. Uh, Fran, did you have a question? Uh, yes, just quickly on this workshop, will citizens be able to ask questions? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, the it's we're calling it a workshop. Um, the forum for this workshop is intended to be more deliberative than kind of like your formal public hearing where, you know, staff does a presentation, nominator, nominator does a presentation, um, and then there's public comments and everybody gets you know, X, Y, and Z amount of time. We're hoping for something that's a little bit more conversational uh, amongst all stakeholders. So, uh, but yes, regardless, the public will be able to, you know, provide, you know, provide comments, ask questions, and be a part of the, the discussion. That's that's a, a feature of the of the change. Thank you. I think it's going to be difficult to do, but good luck. I I, I, I do too. So <laughs> I'll, I'll just be frank. Uh, but we'll we'll get through it. Uh, and I'm that's sure why we, have, we will. That's why we have four nights to to do it over the course of. So. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Well done. Uh, Mr. Brooks, did you still have a question? Uh, nope, I just don't know how to use Teams. Okay, no, it's all good. Mr. Clark, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, just uh, one suggestion for future meetings, if you could require participants to put both their first and last names so that they're fully identified both for other people that are participating and also for the nominators. Because uh, I, I was getting questions from people I did not know who they were. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no problem. All right, Steve. I'll, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Uh, the next next week we will have uh, on Wednesday night again at a se at seven o'clock. We will be joined by the. Uh, Liais by the planning liaisons for the Drainsville and Hunter Mill districts to discuss Tyson's area nominations, uh, uh, Tyson's uh, urban center nominations, and then on the following Thursday, there's a final Providence nomination in the Fallfax area, uh, out between Maryfield and uh, Falls Church, that will be uh, screened at a at a joint meeting with the. Mesa District Planning li Liaison. So everyone who's here tonight, you're also welcome to come out and see uh, and, and discuss some of the other things that have been nominated uh, around the Providence District. And with that, uh, I, I think we're we're done for tonight. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to the nominators. Thank you, members of the public. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, to all of Have you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.